Bien, mesdames et messieurs, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Je voudrais d'abord, je suis Thomas Mélenio, directeur de l'innovation, de la recherche et des savoirs à l'Agence française de développement. Je voudrais tout d'abord remercier les participants qui viennent de loin. Nous avons aujourd'hui et depuis hier un, un plateau assez exceptionnel. Et évidemment, je, je salue à la fois les intervenants et les participants qui, qui viennent de loin. Euh, je remercie également l'IRD pour sa, son aide, son accompagnement dans l'organisation de cet événement. Vous me permettrez d'avoir des mots tout particuliers pour les équipes internes de l'AFD. J'entrevois je, Nathalie, la directrice d'évaluation, Florent, euh, également ma collègue Sylvie Horry. Donc je les, je les salue tout particulièrement parce qu'ils ont fait un travail très important pour réunir l'assistance qui est présente aujourd'hui. Vous dire en, en, en deux mots cette, cette réflexion sur, sur l'évaluation randomisée ou les évaluations expérimentales. Quand on remonte à la création du département de la recherche de l'AFD, on se rend compte que les premières évaluations, en l'occurrence je vois François Roubaud devant moi, mais les premiers projets de recherche ambitieux ont précisément porté sur cette question des, des évaluations, euh, pas uniquement d'ailleurs sur des échantillons randomisés, nous avons bien d'autres méthodologies, donc ce sera certainement débattu plus tard, mais très tôt il y a eu l'idée que la recherche et l'évaluation devaient participer au débat sur les politiques publiques, et d'une certaine manière le... L'enjeu de l'économie expérimentale, ça a été d'apporter, en tout cas c'était le mandat initial, des vérités ou en tout cas des, des éléments solides dans un univers où la politique d'aide au développement suscite beaucoup de, de scepticisme. Et, et finalement, l'objectif d'avoir des stratégies solides d'identification, de recourir à l'expérimentation, c'était aussi celle-là dans un univers où, où les impacts sont très incertains, où l'opinion publique en France exprime des doutes très, très forts hein, sur l'efficacité de l'aide et d'aller plus loin dans les déterminations, la mesure et l'explicitation des, des impacts. Paradoxalement, le, les premières expériences qui ont amené à, pour l'AFD à financer des études randomisées n'ont pas nécessairement conduit à généraliser cette méthodologie, mais plutôt à, la, à diversifier et à construire une gamme d'outils d'évaluation qui va donc des évaluations randomisées sur des échantillons de personnes, mais aussi à travailler sur des évaluations comparant des zones traitées avec des zones qui ne le sont pas, et à rechercher des dispositifs quasi expérimentaux qui ont prouvé euh, non seulement leur robustesse, mais dans certains cas aussi leur, leur, une rapidité pour mener, en, pour mener des études et une solidité que presque, presque équivalente. Donc sachez que dans notre politique d'évaluation, les, éva les évaluations randomisées sont une composante importante. On y consacre des moyens substantiels et qu'elles s'inscrivent dans une démarche d'évaluation avec des choses plus, euh, plus sommaires à l'échelle de, de projets et des évaluations plus, plus complexes. Voilà, je, je parle sous le contrôle d'ailleurs, j'aurais dû la mentionner, mais de notre présidente du comité des évaluations, Anne Pollard, puisque cette mission d'évaluation a été structurée euh, en recourant de manière très régulière, voire systématique, à des partenariats extérieurs et à des partenariats euh, scientifiques. Donc cette idée de trouver à travers l'évaluation des éléments de certitude, ou en tout cas de confort sur les projets d'évaluation, fait l'objet d'une mobilisation très importante et pour laquelle on reconnaît d'ailleurs que des, des efforts conjoints entre nos équipes internes qui conduisent des évaluations, qui publient d'ailleurs dans de bonnes revues, souvent avec des partenaires, mais aussi de rechercher des partenaires externes qui peuvent nous accompagner dans ce type de projet. Euh, il y a aussi d'ailleurs des effets positifs et, et, et d'une certaine manière inattendus de cet effort d'investissement dans les évaluations scientifiques. La culture de la collecte de données, de suivi des données, euh, est d'une certaine manière un produit ou un enfant de, de l'investissement qui a été fait il y a maintenant une dizaine d'années dans les évaluations scientifiques d'impact. Donc encore une fois, nous, nous avons un intérêt de principe pour ces évaluations, nous y avons investi des moyens. Elles ont conduit plutôt à une diversification des outils et aussi à un, de plus en plus, je dirais, à un à des efforts pour collecter des données et s'interroger sur leur sens ou sur les causalités entre nos interventions et les impacts qui sont recherchés. Les, les questions qui, qui subsistent, elles sont peu nombreuses mais très importantes. Dans les questions très importantes qui n'ont pas nécessairement trouvé de réponse, et, et je pense que ça doit être un des sujets du jour, euh, nous faisons des évaluations d'impact mais assez peu d'analyses pour relier ces impacts au coût des politiques publiques que nous finançons. Donc l'impact coût-bénéfice de ces interventions reste, je crois, un, un sujet de recherche. Autre élément, c'est très connu dans la littérature, mais euh, les évaluations scientifiques d'impact ne traitent pas nécessairement des plus grandes questions de développement. Donc nous avons besoin de construire des portefeuilles d'évaluation pour euh, répondre euh, aux questions qui, qui sont celles des agents de développement, mais qui ne sont pas nécessairement celles auxquelles on peut répondre à travers des, à travers des RCT. Et ça, je crois que c'est un euh, une des interrogations majeures dans le domaine de, de l'évaluation. Euh, évidemment, je ne suis... Euh, moins spécialiste que certaines personnes qui s'exprimeront juste après moi, mais tous les enjeux de validité externe des études euh, restent une interrogation pour nous, validité au sens géographique et validité dans le temps. Et, euh, et donc construire des portefeuilles d'enquêtes, euh, d'études de, scientifiques, 
est une, de, une des manières de savoir si l'impact tel qu'on le mesure sur une zone et à un moment donné peut valoir sur d'autres zones et en d'autres temps. Mais pour dire les choses de manière un peu crue, si on investit de, de fortes sommes sur une évaluation à l'échelle d'un projet, souvent on dépasse largement, bah le coût de ce type d'études dépasse largement l'enseignement que l'on peut tirer à l'échelle d'un projet. D'où l'enjeu de trouver des sources ou des moyens pour, 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 pour voilà, dégager des formes de validité externe d'un portefeuille d'évaluation et tirer des leçons euh, plus générales qui peuvent, dé, qui peuvent dépasser les, les, les impacts ou les apprentissages à l'échelle d'un projet unique. Voilà, donc j'ai déjà euh, sans doute dépassé mon, mon temps de parole, mais donc je remercie à nouveau l'IRD et je cède la parole euh, au président directeur général de l'IRD, Jean-Paul Moiti, que je remercie à nouveau de sa présence. Voilà, à toi Jean-Paul. Merci, euh, merci Thomas, merci à l'AFD de, de, de nous accueillir. Uh, I will then turn to English. Uh, <laughs> And I, I will speak uh, today with three hats. Um, first, as an health economist who has uh, interacted for 30 years with French NIH epidemiologists and public health researchers. Uh, although randomized controlled trials have long been presumed to be the ideal source for data on the effects of treatment, other methods of obtaining evidence for decisive action are receiving increased interest in that field. Of course, other study designs like cohort case control studies were used in case randomization was not possible for ethical or practical uh, reasons. For example, I did some case control studies for uh, uh, estimating uh, risk uh, factors due to exposure to environmental threats. Um, but they were considered as a pis aller. Um, but now, most of the limitations that have led to more recent explorations of alternatives to RCTs in public health deal with their external validity or their non-timeliness for decision making. Because well-designed RCTs evenly distributes known and unknown factors among control and intervention groups, they reduce the potential for confounding factors in, in the identification of causal mechanism. However, Epidemiologists themselves insist that RCT often lack external validity. Generalization of findings outside the study population may be invalid. Usually, RCTs do not have sufficient study periods or population sizes to assess duration of treatment effect. For example, uh, the things we find when we do post-marketing surve surveillance on the long term. Of course, uh, RCT cannot uh, give you something there. The increasingly high cost and time constraint of RCTs can also lead more and more to reliance on surrogate biological markers, for example, that may not correlate well with the real outcome of interest, the survival, the quality of life, and so on. The fact that RCTs are long and costly to implement um, analyze their, uh, reduce their capacity to keep pace with innovations and to be a, a, a good answer to uh, epidemiologic outbreaks where we, you have to take uh, public health de decisions very quickly, as we did recently for the Ebola or the Zika virus. Indeed, the current mood in the public health community is that actual evidence grading systems are too much bi biased in favor of, of RCTs, which may lead to inadequate consideration of non-RCT data. But what is interesting, and there was a recent paper by Thomas Cook, an epidemiologist in social science in medicine last year, is that more and more biostatisticians have expressed concern about the internal validity of RCTs. Uh, in his paper, Cook um, lists to 26 factors that may bias uh, uh, RCT result, and 22 of these 26 problems uh, are related to internal validity, not external validity. Um, uh, an example, for example, uh, is that uh, uh, the, the attrition from the trial may be uh, different between the two groups, and, and this change uh, uh, create problem. Something that I have faced as a researcher is that the being in a trial uh, may change the behavior of people. And we had example in AIDS where uh, the, the, the patients which were in, in uh, uh, active uh, uh, NGO groups, they just sh it was a double blind, a double blind um, uh, trial and uh, the, the, the patients in the group started to share their drugs. 
in order to, uh, uh, um, to the extent to that some of them, uh, everybody had uh, some fair uh, access to a, a, a bad therapy. And also uh, a number of trials I did in oncology, I could see in practice how the preference of the practitioners, of the healthcare professionals who include people in the trial, whether they are in favor of the innovation or against it for cultural or bi biomedical reasons, bias in practice the way randomization is acted. But th the more general argument is that if randomization ignores prior information from theory and from covariates, it is uh, even unethical because it exposes people unnecessarily to a possible harm in a risky experiment. experiment. And therefore, methodological mod modifications are increasingly um, put out by public health uh, experts and epidemiologists. I don't have time to, to detail that, but we talk about stratification, adaptive allocation, uh, um, uh, other types of uh, designs like uh, um, uh, single case designs. All these designs, well, in, in fact, change the, the usual way the, the classical individual randomization um, is, is done. Uh, recently, we had, we, we had a fight that I lost against epidemiologists to, to build a, a, um, a trial in KwaZulu-Natal uh, about uh, uh, systematic uh, access to antiretroviral uh, uh, therapy um, for all patients. Uh, they, they imposed us um, uh, individual randomization while I was in favor of group randomization, which would have been more practical. And in the end, very quickly, the, they, were in, uh, they had to renounce to the design, and it, it trans we transformed that to an open trial. Uh, again, an example of a tyranny of excessive randomization going to bad practical solution. Um, which leads to my second act as an econometrician who is familiar with alternative methods like propensity score, match, score matching, instrumental variables, uh, uh, causal Bayesian networks, and all the things that many of you in the room know that, that are a good alternative to randomization for a number of reasons. Um, uh, for we know that uh, uh, Nobel, Nobel Prize uh, Angus uh, Deaton uh, uh, has uh, argued that uh, any special status for uh, RCTs is unwarranted. And, and the first set of econometric arguments by Deaton and others question the idea that average treatment effects estimated from RCTs are always uh, more likely to be closer to the truth than uh, uh, other methods to estimate such uh, uh, average treatment effects. And in fact, I looked at the literature, thank you, uh, Isabel, it goes back to 1926. 1926, Nobel Prize Ir Irving Fisher uh, work uh, and comments on his agricultural field experiments. And it also goes back to Savage, uh, 1962, which already uh, pointed out that a Bayesian, and I'm a Bayesian, uh, as many others uh, here, should not choose the allocation of treatments and control systematically at random, but in such a way that given what else is already known about the topic, uh, uh, um, the best design, the, the design which is more likely to generate new evidence. The general critic, and this is important to know, that now biostatisticians agree with us econometri in econometrics about that, uh, that problem. So it's not uh, uh, economists against uh, biostatisticians. We agree on that now. Um, is that uh, randomization provides the basis for calculating the size of an error, but, and everything is in the but, conditional on the caveat that no post-randomization correlation with covariates has occurred. And uh, we have many examples of, of cases where it can uh, uh, happen. Uh, just one, I could uh, have listed uh, 10 of 20. One, for example, is the, 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 the key assumption that uh, um, there is a threat to significant testing when there is an asymmetric distribution of the individual, tr individual treatment effects in the study population. The second critic dating back to Nobel Prize, another one, uh, Ekman, uh, uh, as early as Journal of Economic Perspective 1995, more than 20 years ago, uh, about uh, which expect to what extent the, the, the average treatment effect is the, the, the information we need to inform policy. Uh, and and uh, basically the argument of Ekman is that if the question is the question of does it work, Yes, of course, randomized trials, with all the criticism I already said, can be an appropriate design. And it's, it's very often a good design when you compare two drugs. But if the question is not only does it work, 
But if it works, why does it work? Then there is absolutely no statistical superiority of a randomized um, design in comparison to other methods to control for bias, and we know a lot of them through Ekman and other uh, and others work. And in fact, in social science, in development, what we want to assess very often is not single component intervention; it's multi-component programs. And let's take an example. We know, and sometimes it pisses me off. Sorry. Uh, that uh, the World Bank tries to send us conditional cash transfer as the uh, gold standard um, for uh, health and education policies. And they say, yes, the reason why it's a gold standard is that it has been proven by RCTs. Again, another gold standard for another mistaken gold standard. Um, but uh, yes, of course, let's be, ser but let's be serious. The conditional cash, ca cash transfer may work in some uh, context, but uh, will not certainly work in other context. If your school system or your health system totally dysfunctions, forget about conditional cash transfer, right? Um, and it should not, of course, it can be useful in some instances, but RCTs or no RCTs, it should not um, um, make, uh, give us uh, an, an argument or a pretext not to solve a real problem, which is to build a coherent system for universal health coverage or universal education coverage. Which le leads me to my s third and most important act. I will be shorter on this, but it is the most important one. Uh, at, um, as a CEO of uh, IRD, but also as a member, uh, and Lance, we discussed that we had a meeting about that recently, uh, as a member of an expert panel which has been appointed by the UN Secretary General to produce the first critical assessment of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and, and with that act, uh, it's clear for me that we need to develop what we call now in the literature sustainability science, which is a science which is not driven by the disciplines, although it may have to mobilize many disciplines, including the most basic ones, like from astrophysics to econometrics in, in, some, in some cases, but in order to solve the problems, um, to develop participative science with communities, uh, and, of course, it's uh, systematically an interdisciplinary uh, 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 approach. Um, and, and clearly, clearly, um, RCT dogmatism is antagonist with sustainability, uh, the sustainability science we urgently need. But that doesn't mean that we don't need sometimes to do our randomized experiments, of course. Uh, from, from a sustainability, I will conclude on that, from a sustainability science point of view, RCTs are both oversold and undersold. Uh, they are oversold because extrapolating or generalizing randomized results requires a great deal of in, uh, additional information that can only be provided by other methods. Um, and, and, uh, 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 and, and putting too much emphasis on RCTs uh, on the basis of a mistaken belief that they are the gold uh, standard will certainly slow down the necessary um, dynamics of interdisciplinary uh, research. On the other hand, uh, RCTs are also to some extent undersold because um, they, they can serve many more interesting purposes than just predicting that results obtained in one setting can be generalized in another setting. In fact, RCTs relate to knowledge that you are, again, you have to be Bayesian on this. Uh, RCTs uh, relate to the knowledge that you already possess about the states of the world, and much of this uh, uh, knowledge is obtained by other uh, methods, and it is only if RCTs uh, are located in that interdisciplinary framework of knowledge that in some cases they may help us to solve some practical questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to introduce the first part of this, uh, of this event. I'm, I'm really very pleased to introduce this, uh, this, this, this event. Maybe I was thinking that uh, to, sh to start with, maybe I should remind you very briefly um, what we're talking about, because maybe some of you in the room don't know, about, don't know anything about RCTs. So let me take just one minute to explain the basic principle of RCTs. 
so the main uh, uh, purpose of RCTs is to, uh, to compare the outcome of a particular intervention, whether a project, a policy, or a program, with what would have happened had the intervention not taken place. And the challenge is to isolate uh, the effect of the intervention from uh, all, all other effects that may also have an impact on the population targeted by the uh, intervention. Then the, 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 the solution uh, uh, provided by uh, RCTs is to draw a random as assignment between two groups within an homogeneous population. And so the first group uh, receives uh, the intervention, a drug, grant, microcredit, training, or whatever. And the second receives either uh, a placebo or a different intervention or simply nothing. And at the end, after a certain period of time, the two groups are compared in order to assess the impact of the, of the intervention uh, or sometimes to analyze two distinct modalities of the same uh, in, in intervention. And the difference between the two groups uh, is attributed to the, to the intervention. Well, uh, this method is not new. I think it was quite interesting to have uh, the talk by, by Jean-Paul Moati, who reminded us that uh, uh, this method has a long history, uh, especially in medicine. And, uh, and in medicine, it has already been the subject of much debate. Um, but it is only recently, let's say over the last 15 years, uh, that it has been increasingly used in the, in the field of uh, development aid with a wide range of interventions, just to name a few examples, in the field of education, incentives to uh, reduce teacher absenteeism or the warming to, 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 to reduce a student absence in the field of, in the field of health, um, water filters, uh, mosquito nets, training or bonus schemes for health workers, uh, in the field of finance, microcredit, uh, financial education, uh, and, and so forth. Okay, fine. There is no doubt that um, uh, this method represents a progress on many aspects. There is no doubt that it can provide answers to a certain number of, of, of questions, as uh, Jean-Paul Moitier was saying. The problem, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to repeat what, is, what, what, what has been said, but I think it's worthwhile repeating it, the fact that they are too often, and especially now in the field of, uh, uh, of, of, of development and in the field of development economics in particular, they are too often, uh, uh, and even though many debates have taken place uh, in medicine and also in the field of social policy in the US, for instance, a long time back, but sometimes uh, people don't have any memory, um, and they are too often presented as the only rigorous uh, and even uh, scientific methods. Well, yet, as many of you know, in the field of evaluation, including in the field of development, uh, this field also has a long history with the development of multiple methods, quantitative, qualitative, methods which have proven their worth. And still, uh, there is this kind of gold standard which is proclaimed, both by some of the uh, proponents of this method who claim to be able to solve uh, all development problems with this method. We also have to acknowledge the fact that this popularity is also uh, highly appreciated by the number of policymakers who are easily seduced by the, by the apparently simplicity of the method, you know, to population, comparison, uh, average results, clear results. This is very appealing for a number of uh, decision makers. So now let me come to the, to the, to the problem. Uh, and again, I'm going to, to, to repeat what has been, has been said, but the, the big problem is a tremendous gap between the proclaimed superiority of the method and what RCTs can really achieve uh, in, in practice. And this gap, as we are going to discuss with other speakers, has a number of several consequences in the way uh, we understand impact uh, and, 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 and the way we, we understand the, the effect of development, but also in the way development interventions are designed. Uh, so the main purpose of this conference is to, uh, is to discuss the exact scope of RCT methods in the field of development. And our idea is uh, not to be against or in favor of RCT, but rather to question uh, and, 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 and to delimate, to delimate the scope of application of the, of, the, of the method. So just before giving the floor to our speakers, uh, let me very quickly uh, 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 explain you where does this uh, conference come from. It's part of a long-term tradition, uh, a long-standing long long collaboration between uh, IFD researchers, in particular Florent Bedecara, uh, who is a political scientist at IFD, and IRD researchers, uh, François Roubault, who is a uh, statistician and development economist, and myself, a social economist. Um, our collaboration started uh, seven years ago, and at that time we were seeing the, the growing influence of, of our cities. Uh, so we decided to join forces to counter, um, to counter, try to counter uh, this uh, supremacy that we found extremely uh, uh, problematic. We were not the first one, of course. A number of speakers uh, this afternoon 
uh, have been a, a pioneer in this criticism, but our contribution has been twofold. Uh, first, using a political economy approach, by this I mean looking at the, uh, at the power games between various actors, to understand the gap between, on the one hand, the so-called gold standard, and on the other hand, the very narrow scope of ap application of the method, uh, and, and to understand why certain voices are much more influential than others. And another of our contribution has been to explore the concrete, uh, we all of us are, uh, the three of us are field researchers, and uh, what we've been trying to do is to explore the concrete implementation of RCT in the field, outside their ideal laboratory conditions. And what we find that in practice, uh, our cities are easier said than done, and they face a number of uh, challenges which are uh, relate related to the specificity of the method, and which clearly show that a number of conditions are necessary for this method to effectively provide uh, rigorous uh, responses. This event today uh, results from our willingness to go a step further and by bringing together a number of leading specialists, including uh, these colleagues with, uh, who don't necessarily share the same view. Uh, so one year, some, something like one year ago, we decided to initiate a collective book, uh, which main objective is to define the scope of application of RCTs in the field of, of, of development. Obviously, RCT have not been able to keep up their promises, yet what scope uh, do they actually have? Which sort of questions are they able to address and which uh, uh, are the questions do they fail to answer, um, for which <coughs> development issues and interventions are RCTs adapted and under what conditions, what are the lessons that can be learned from RCT, but also what are the unexpected effects and what are the risks and the dangers of the rising use of this method, and uh, importantly, what are the other uh, available methods. So in order to answer these questions, we, we approach a wide range of, of leading specialists and by background in disciplines, economics, econometrics, political economy, mathematics, global and public health, medicine, and most of them are there today. And our objective is to address the, the very, uh, some various facets of the, of the debate. Technical and statistical aspects are there very clearly, but it is only one part of the story and maybe not the, import the most important one. A key aspect of the debate also has to do with epi epistemological uh, uh, posture. And what do we mean by scientific evidence? What do we mean by causality? Uh, a key aspect also has to do with political issues. What do we mean by development? What do we mean by, um, uh, what do we mean by, uh, what, what is the type of society we want to live in? And these are often some of the questions behind uh, the disagreement regarding the role of RCTs. Ethical aspects, which are crucial. Uh, we also wanted to combine broad views with sector-based views, uh, with the idea that uh, the RCT debate take different forms depending upon the kind of intervention. So with this group of colleagues, we met yesterday and this morning to work uh, 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 together on this collective project, to discuss, debate, uh, argue, disagree sometimes. And at the end, this book uh, has the ambition to present a current picture of, of, of the main strengths and, and weaknesses of RCTs uh, in development. And the conference today intends to give you uh, uh, an idea of what the book will be about. So we're fortunate to have a large number of colleagues who are very well known in their fields with complementary fields of expertise. Uh, we made the choice of uh, giving them all the opportunity to speak. So the program is very dense, and we apologize for that, but uh, very sincerely, I think you won't regret it. So our conference is divided into three parts. We have a first roundtable entitled Crossfire Panel. Do we need to experiment what works for sustainable development? Then we have a testimony from a colleague, Britta Augsburg, who is a leading RCT uh, specialist uh, who will share her experience regarding the, the practice of RCT. And then we have a second round table, uh, methods, practices, narratives, and ethics. Um, so let me introduce the first round table. So we have four speakers, uh, all economists, all male, <laughs> if I may, but still from diverse backgrounds and positions and, and, and diverse experience regarding RCT. Let me introduce them very, very briefly because uh, I'm not going to, to, to to read all the distinctions, the presentation, otherwise we will be, still be there tomorrow. Uh, so we start with Martin Ravalion, who is one of the world's most well-known economists in the field of uh, poverty and inequality, uh, presently holding the inaugural uh, Villani Chair of Economics at Georgetown University. Ten years ago, uh, Martin Ravalion was among the first to question the, the claimed superiority of RCTs in development with a noteworthy paper entitled Should the Randomista Rule? 
uh, for this project, we invited him 10 years later to update his, his position. Uh, then we've asked Raduban to, to react to, to Martin Ravalin's talk. Raduban is a senior program officer in the field of water, sanitation, and hygiene at the uh, Dill and Merida Gates Foundation. He's leading the measurement and evidence work on those uh, in, in that particular field, and this leads him to, to, to work with a large number of, of, of methods. Uh, then we will have a talk by Jonathan Mordek, who is Professor of Public Policy and Economics at New York University. He's one of the world's uh, most well-known economists in the field of microfinance and financial inclusion, a uh, uh, field in which RCT has been uh, widely used. So that we, we have asked him to, to share his vision on, of the role of RCT in this uh, specific area. And then uh, I will ask Lance Pritchett to react. Lance Pritchett, who is currently professor in development economics at Harvard's Kennedy School of <coughs> Government. So you can see that we have a nice uh, casting. Uh, he's also a very well-known development economist in various fields, education, migration, state capacity, economic growth, uh, <coughs> name only a few, and he has already written uh, intensively on uh, RCT. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, unfortunately, and since our schedule is very tight, um, we'll take uh, questions only at the end of the, of the conference, uh, which is also a way to force you to stay until the end. Uh, it's a bit frustrating for the audience, but this is a choice we made in order to give you the opportunity to listen to the various points of view of our research group. So I stop here and I give the floor to uh, Martin for something like 20 minutes. Okay, thank you all for coming, and uh, thanks, my thanks to the organizers for inviting me, and uh, I, if you wait around, I'd really like to hear what you think about all this. Um, after the first, the last two talks, uh, Jean-Paul's excellent talk and Isabel's, I, I, my contrarian nature is leading me to think I should say something good about randomized control trials. <laughs> but I'm going to resist that temptation. Um, and give you a truly unbiased assessment. Actually, I'm going to step back a bit. Um, uh, how can we, my question today, how can we, how can I make our evaluations better serve, uh, better inform public policy decisions? Um, you know, governments and development agencies, uh, non-governmental agencies too, throughout the world are, are really trying to do a better job. They're trying to learn from evidence about what works and what doesn't. And, and they're turning to uh, economists and statisticians, others, to, to help answer that question. I want to ask today whether the, the approaches we're, we're applying to answer those questions are really up to the mark. Are they appropriate? Two messages um, from this talk. First, policymakers remain poorly informed about what works and what does not, in part because we do too little evaluation. We often evaluate the wrong things, and we often do it the wrong way. Everything else is fine. <laughs> no other problems that I can see. So we're uh, not in terribly bad shape yet. I'm going to step back and ask, you know, wha what's the problem here? Uh, as an economist, I, if, I, if I think that there's too little evaluation, or I think things aren't working, I, I kind of look for a market failure or institutional failure, some, some reason why this is happening, and that, that's going to be the theme of this first first part of this talk. Knowledge market failures. Whenever we have a market failure, an economist thinks about one of two things or both of them. Information problems, what we call asymmetric information, situations of imperfect information, uh, or, or we think about externalities. If you think about the evaluation problem, uh, this is both of these things are present. The information problem is, is people really are poorly informed. Users are poorly informed about what went into the evaluation. Okay. Most users, policymakers using evaluative data, often, there are exceptions, but often really don't know what went into this. They have a hard time judging the quality. Uh, there's all kinds of ways in which bad methods, mistakes, uh, deliberate manipulations, um, Stuff happens along the way, uh, non-rigorous methods that start to crowd out rigorous methods and 
by the way, I'm, when I say rigorous, I don't mean randomized control trials necessarily. Um, they start to crowd out the, the good stuff. Um, if we're asymmetric information problems of my colleague George Akalov at Georgetown uh, wrote a brilliant paper on this that he got the Nobel Prize for, uh, on the market for lemons, the way inf uh, information asymmetry can crowd out good cars from the car market. Uh, this is in a paper in 19, around 1970. A similar problem with evaluations. Externalities, another big concern. Uh, benefits spill over. Uh, uh, maybe there are project people in this room, and I've been a project person actually doing development projects. Um, when you, they're the people deciding about how much to spend on the evaluation typically. But they're not the sole beneficiaries. In fact, for a, not, for a lot of impact evaluation, they're not even beneficiaries at all because we don't know the results until after the project. So there's an automatically an externalities problem here all kinds of ways in which the people making the decisions, key decisions, not the only decisions, but some key inputs to decisions about how much to invest and what to do, uh, don't take account of the external benefits to others, which are other who are other project officers in other projects in that country, other countries. There's a range of users for evaluation data who actually don't get a say in those key decisions. And that's both of these things, information asymmetry, information uh, imperfections, and externalities point to the need, to, they point to two problems. First, they point to the, the potential for an underinvestment in evaluation, or but for bad evaluations to drive out good ones. But they also point to the need for some kind of, uh, whenever you have an externality, you think about some kind of subsidy or price adjustment or something that will make try to correct this market failure. We're going to need some form of, of help to achieve the optimum. Without centrally mandated uh, support, we will underinvest. There are a whole host of current biases. <laughs> Excuse me, my throat. There are a whole host of, of current biases in what gets evaluated. By and large, our evaluation strategies are oriented towards uh, a bunch of non-randomly uh, selected projects and, and, and policies. And that's a problem. If you want to evaluate what works in development, you're going to try and find a representative sample of what we do in development, and you're going to evaluate that. There's a strange inconsistency between uh, this obsession economists have developed for internal validity, for removing selection bias, removing bias in a particular program, the evaluation of a particular program, ignoring the potential biases in the evaluation of the entire portfolio of what we do in development. And that's going to be another theme that I'm going to come back to. Uh, we evaluate assigned programs, assigned, neatly assigned programs, where you, you know somebody participates and somebody else doesn't. That leaves out, automatically leaves out, a whole host of things we do in development. It l probably leads out, leads, leaves out almost all the things that have achieved the, the poverty reduction we've seen in the world. What China did, for example. What Malaysia did. What Indonesia's doing. What Thailand did. These are all in, these are major success stories <laughs> that came from, I would argue, and I've argued in, uh, in detail elsewhere, came from uh, policy efforts that would not be evaluated if you relied solely on assigned programs in this model of impact evaluation, both RCTs and non-RCTs. We also tend to evaluate short-lived uh, projects. Um, I spent 10 years evaluating a poor development program in China. I was pulling teeth. That was so hard to get that thing to go last for 10 years, even at the World Bank. Once the money had stopped flowing, we wanted to know the impact of the, evalu impact of the program well after the money had stopped flowing, but I had a real hard time financing that evaluation for 10 years. Our first five years was relatively easy when the, the, the money is flowing. But after the event, uh, much more difficult. All kinds of uh, problems here. If we're relying on PhD students, and I increasingly rely on PhD students, my PhD students, to, to do evaluations, I mean, you know, 10 years, forget it. A young assistant professor trying to get tenure for 10 years, forget it. And yet a lot of the things that we want to know are over a much longer time horizon than any of this seem to work. So our knowledge is skewed through the methods we use and what gets evaluated towards projects with well-defined beneficiaries and yielding quick results. 
Another issue, interaction effects. This is kind of basically ignored by everybody in this field, as I can figure, and despite my protests. When we think about uh, uh, the things we do in development, they're interacting all the time, both positively and negatively. You know, if you, if you build a health clinic, it helps a lot if you also have a road to get to it. All kinds of ways in which the multi-sectoral things we do interact, often positively, sometimes negatively. We can't ignore that when we evaluate. So the tendency now to decentralize the evaluation decision, which we're seeing all over the place, uh, is going to run into problems. You're going to have double counting. You're going to leave out the interaction effects. You're going to um, uh, all kinds of issues of, for example, underestimating or overestimating the impact. You'll, you'll tend to overestimate the impact with positive interaction effects and so on. We need to look at the entire portfolio of what we do. We need to consider those interaction effects to get a complete picture. Current biases, second aspect of current bias is how we evaluate. And we have a current obsession, and I like it in economics, an obsession with unbiasedness. Unbiasedness is a well-defined concept that in expectation we get the right answer. In expectation meaning we do enough trials, we have enough samples. Of course, we don't do endless trials. We do one trial and we're drawing from a distribution. It's going to have a measurement error and it's going to have a sampling error. And even without a measurement error, it's a drawing from one, it's one draw from a bigger distribution, and we don't know whether the, the, there's, there's a balance in terms of treat, uh, observables and unobservables. We simply don't know that. You, don't, you can't infer that the, the difference between the treatment and the counterfactual in a single trial is the impact of the intervention. That is just wrong. Because of, of, and of course, Ronald Fisher, not Irving Fisher, Ronald Fisher knew that. And he's developed the statistics for randomized control trials. He's fully aware of that. Um, the problem then is if we, if we focus on one method, and I could make this argument about matching methods as easily as I could make this argument about randomized control trials. If we focus on just one method, the risk is that we're going to magnify or create a bias in our development knowledge that uh, is worrying. Another way of thinking about it, a better approach if you really care about internal validity for the inferences you make about development effort, if you really care about that, you want an unbiased estimate of the impact of the development portfolio, what would you do? Well, you might randomly select some projects for evaluation or, or a representative sample of projects, and then you'd find the best method for each thing that you draw. You wouldn't start with a method. You'd start with the complete portfolio of what we do in development, and you'd evaluate that. A broader uh, example of that is, as I teach my students, and I, with some frustration, used to say a lot in the World Bank, Start with an interesting question, don't start with a method. Whenever you start with a method, you're drawn in a, um, potentially um, a, a selected subsample of knowledge and maybe not uh, learning as much as you could. Second message, we can do better, but there are some real challenges here in both the analytics and the administration implementation. Um, this is my last slide, or second to last slide, but it's uh, the pat. Um, I'm going to make 10 recommendations for better evaluation and practice. Um, it's nice that it came out to exactly 10. I hadn't planned that, but uh, it's neat. Okay, first, start with a policy-relevant question, be eclectic on methods, and I've emphasized that already. It's so important. And, and the problem is, in the sense we all, whatever field you're in, if it's economics or something else, and you were trained in that field, uh, we have a tendency to, to go through life with that bag of tricks that we were taught in graduate school, and, and we're all the time looking for applications for that bag of tricks. And, you know, if we've got a big bag of tricks, we might be fine. A little bag of tricks, it could be a problem. But there's a, there's a, a worry there, obviously. Right? We're looking for applications of the methods we know. And, and it's, it's natural that that's the process we go through, but it's, 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 it's something we've got to fight, we've got to resist. The more we can start to look for interesting questions in development and then find the appropriate methods, whether they take us, keep us within our uh, field of uh, initial field, whether it takes you out of economics if you're an economist, uh, that, that could be interesting and important, but focus on those key questions. And, and that seems like an obvious common sense thing to say, uh, but it's not what's happening. Uh, it happens amongst the best uh, analysts working on this topic, 
uh, but it's not the general rule. Second uh, recommendation, do take ethics seriously. And, and I really emphasize that. And it, it's um, e ethics as well as political sensitivities. They're, they're not the same thing. But if you don't, you're, you're gonna, there's a real chance that uh, important things won't get learnt. Uh, because if you only confront the ethics when it becomes a newspaper headline and you, 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 you never thought, uh, thought about it, you could be in real trouble from the point of view of longer term investments in knowledge. Uh, and the ethical issues are, are, are real. And I've argued uh, elsewhere in the Handbook of Economic Ethics, I argue that the randomized control trials are in fact ethically contestable. They're, they're, there's something inherent in a randomized control trial with heterogeneous impacts, which makes you worried. The reason that why I'm saying that is, uh, you know, it wouldn't be fair to say it to blame an evaluation for an ethically contestable project. That's not interesting. So let's assume the project is okay ethically. Then the issue of contestability must be, are you evaluating that project or something different? But as soon as you have heterogeneous impacts, when you randomize uh, assignment, your your people getting the project are a different group of people to those who'll be in the in the pilot, to a different group of people to those in the scaled up program, the national program, if you wish. If you're doing a pilot with the potential of scaling up to a national program, these are different programs because a program isn't just defined by what you do; it's defined by the set of beneficiaries. When you scale up, you're going to self people will self select into the program on the basis of unobserved factors that you can't possibly take account of, which include. Uh, factors that determine the impact from the pro to of that program for them, then that's, uh, that's going to be a, a, a concern. So ethically, it is automatically ethically contestable. And that needs to be confronted. That does not mean randomized control trials are a bad idea. It just means you need to make the case. How do you make the case? You have to argue why you think the benefits from knowledge outweigh the ethically contestable fact that you're withholding the treatment from people who need it and giving the treatment to people who don't. And unless you confront that issue head on, make the argument as to why the benefits outweigh those costs, uh, I think it is, becomes highly contentious. I, I'm, not, I'm not arguing that won't be possible. I, I actually think a lot of randomized control trials generate a lot of useful knowledge, and so do non-RCTs. Um, but, I, but I think um, unless we ex ante make the argument, we're in trouble. Uh, thirdly, uh, take a comprehensive approach to, to sources of bias. Uh, here there's another bias, if you like, in, in uh, the way economists work, that we tend to focus on one source of bias, uh, selection on unobservables, and ignore another source of bias, which could be equally important, selection on observables. This is an, one of many things I learned from the work of Jim Heckman, but um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of ways in which we don't necessarily deal with selection on observables in a useful way. Economists are fond of writing down linear models, linear and parameters. Where does that come from? I actually only know one theory in economics that generates a linear specification, which is Jacob Mintz's famous paper on, on um, compensating differentials. It generates a, a model of log earnings, linear and schooling. I don't think it's a particularly great model, but it, it is a, a theoretical model that generates a re linear regression. No, but that's not normally the case. We write down a linear model, it's completely ad hoc. Parametric models have really got to be thought, uh, uh, thought about a bit more. But that means we've got to think about, and we've also learned from the work of, uh, of people like Heckman, but we also learned that, that a lot of the things that go wrong are actually not about this selection on observables problem that we're obsessed with. They're actually about a bad efforts at dealing with selection on observables, including uh, linear parametric models which uh, were inappropriate. Fourth, do a better job on spiller effects. Spiller effects are, arise from all kinds of, they're getting more attention, uh, not still not as much in my view. When I talked about assigned programs, uh, the big assumption there, you know, some people get the program and some people don't get the program. And the big assumption here is that get the people over here getting the program doesn't in any way influence the people who don't get the program. And all kinds of ways in which that's so implausible. People interact. They interact through markets, prices, and we had uh, one w w recent uh, World Bank study by, by Jed Friedman and others which showed very nicely how a uh, targeted cash transfer program <laughs> uh, ended up uh, worsening child nutrition because of the spiller effects through food prices to the non-participant group. 
but they're not just interacting through price, through markets, they're also interacting through the behaviour of other agents, the behaviour of local governments. If you're, a, you're an a, people from an aid agency here, when you go into a country and you think, oh, I'm going to give aid to, say, some poor villagers over here, right, don't forget that there's a, a local government that's also making decisions. So if you decide, I'm going to give the aid to this village and not that village, and there's this local government who sees you doing that, what are they going to do? Perfectly rationally, they're going to reassign their efforts away from the targeted village toward the control village. That's a classic example of the Spurler effect, giving bias and your double diffs and all of that. Right? Very clear, I think, but, but we, we ignore it. There are other Spiller effects to cluster designs of, uh, uh, randomized cluster designs are full of problems from this point of view. But they're maybe not taken nearly enough seriously. But um, the fifth, take a sectoral approach. Fungibility and flypaper effects are, are, are a concern. Um, I love talking about fungibility in, uh, with development project people. I, at the World Bank for 20 years, well, 25 years, what am I saying? I would talk about fungibility and I'd get this blank look from project people and. <gasps> Really? Uh, well, okay. Uh, well what's the weather like today? Um, no, I mean, fungibility here is just the basic concern that you could be evaluating entirely the wrong thing. Governments behave and respond. You know, if, you're, if you've got a package of money, and I, if I'm, I'm president of some country and I've, I've got two projects I'd, I, I, I'd like to do, one really bad project and one really good project, I can, on my own money resources, I can't do, I can't do both of them. The bad project is so bad that no way with my own country's resources I'd do the bad project, so I'll do the good project. And the World Bank comes along and says, oh, I've got uh, money for a loan. Um, anything you'd uh, like to borrow for? Oh, actually, I've got this, this project, a really good project. Really good. Why don't you borrow for that? Oh, can I borrow for that? Terrific. That money goes out. What happens? I freed up resources to do the bad project. What did the World Bank finance? The bad project. What do we evaluate? The good project. Ah, something's wrong. Um, fully explore, in six point, fully explore in, in impact heterogeneity. We don't do that enough, particularly heterogeneity, in, not just in observables, as the interaction effects and our regression between the treatment and X, not just in observables, but also in unobservables. What uh, is, uh, is often called essential heterogeneity and random coefficients models. And you don't need to worry about all that if it's gobbledygook, but the point is clear. Think about the ways in which, the diverse ways in which a project can have impact. And there are many. Uh, sixth, seventh, sorry, take scaling up seriously. When we scale up interventions from a pilot, every lot of things change. And we see this all the time. The inputs change, incentives change for participation. Scaling up is a it's not a simple thing of taking any pilot that I've ever seen and just, bang, multiply it by some number. Well, the general equilibrium effects will appear. All kinds of things are going to change. And we've got to think about those things. Eighth, I think I'm pretty much out of time, but it only take me a minute. Eighth, understand what determines impact. Uh, randomizations, uh, randomized <coughs> control trials, and a lot of non-RCTs too are, are black boxes. We don't understand what's inside this thing, how it had impact. And that's not very useful, particularly for policymakers. I, I've rarely met a policymaker who, who, I don't think I've ever met a policymaker who only wanted to know the average treatment effect. I, I can't recall it anyway. They want to know all kinds of stuff. They want to know the, basically, they want to know the joint distribution of outcomes under treatment and outcomes under the counterfactual. They want to know who, who amongst the poor, for example, is going to lose or win. And well, they want to know a whole range of stuff that we can't tell them. In classic evaluations, we really can't tell them. In classic uh, RCTs, for example, it's not an estimable parameter. The impact estimate of each in of individual is never known. We estimate one parameter of that distribution, the mean. And, I, and I, I'd argue it's, it is only one parameter, and it's not necessarily the most interesting parameter. We need to get inside that black box. Um, ninth, and this relates to the last one, don't reject theory and structural methods. We've got this emerge in this world where, where, where suddenly economic theory, which I have huge regard for, and uh, I, I'm very unhappy if any of my students do empirical work without uh, some solid theoretical foundations, but it's kind of gone out the window. And this is very worrying for understanding what determines impact. Uh, we don't necessarily <coughs> trust economic theory, but we need it, we need to modify it, we need to make it realistic. Uh, but we can't ignore it. And, and last, an evaluation culture. 
How do we develop that in governments? This is something I've agonized over for, for a long time. Uh, what's the mechanism, how to do it? And I know I've got, I've got a simple answer. I've got a few examples. I mean, Conizal in Mexico, I think, is a great example. And what's great about that, this is um, a, a group that basically decides what needs to be evaluated in the government. They look at everything and they see this needs to be evaluated. They don't necessarily get it right, but they're doing what I, if you are listening to the talk earlier, what I was suggesting about looking at that portfolio. They're, they're, they're making sure that the policy relevant knowledge gaps drive the evaluation agenda. And it's going to require some constraints. You know, researchers like to just work on their own, evaluate whatever they like, and, and so on. Uh, and it's not in the culture of researchers, decentralized, independent academic researchers, to subscribe to a model which tells them what to do. But I'm afraid we're going to need that, and we're going to need agencies like Conovar, which at least incentivize efforts to evaluate, to fill the knowledge gaps we face in policy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, for this very uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. I think it really sets the, the, the terms of the debate. I, I invite uh, Radu Ban to react for something like 10 minutes, based on your own uh, experience and practice. Thank you, uh, Isabel. Thank you, Martin, for such a great way to kick off the, the conversation. And thanks to our colleagues at, uh, at AFD for bringing us over here and, and spending two days together in, in fairly uh, heated and, and active debates. It was really um, a, a great time. Um, I guess one thing that I would encourage you to do more is to have less manuals. So please make an effort to, to, you know, to, to look for women who can really contribute to the debate because there certainly are the, some of them out there. Uh, and now I'll, I'll, I'll actually move to the, to, the, um, to the response. I mean, I really cannot disagree with, uh, with what Martin said, but what I can do is maybe, uh, as Isabel hinted already, to, to sort of give some example of how some of the criticism that Martin has mentioned play out in you know, in the field that, that I'm currently in, which is the field of sanitation, right? And, uh, you know, when I saw the, the, the picture in the, in the background of Nelson Mandela, uh, I, it, it, it kind of rung a bell because on the third floor of our building back in Seattle, we have this great quote from, from Nelson Mandela, which, you know, you spend enough time there, we kind of remember it. And he said that there is no passion to be found in playing small, in living a life less than the one you're capable of living. Right, and uh, I'll use that to 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 introduce what I'm what I'm going to, to talk about. So, some cases where where I feel the the, the randomized control trials are are overused uh, and some and often misinterpreted uh, is when they try to answer questions like, okay, does um, sanitation impact human health? Right, and you know I think. Most of us have a sense that it's probably a good idea to, you know, to, to separate human from, from their feces because of the entire pathogen uh, load. And, you know, in fact, there's been some great papers based on, on historical data, not based on, on trials, which show that as you introduce, you know, pipe sewerage and, and chlorination, you know, you get rid of diseases like typhoid, uh, right, or, 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 you know, other infectious diseases that relate to, to, you know, to fecal pathogens. But when you do uh, some trials on, on, on the impact of sanitation and health, you test things like, okay, what happens if you put, you know, a cover on, on a pit latrine, right? Or what happens <laughs> when you put in, you know, a tippy tap for people to wash their hands, right? So that seems like, you know, playing small. It, it's, it feels like, well, you know, to address the, the problem of, of sanitation, you don't put a cover on tippy tap, you provide the proper service, you know, you provide running water. So when you're trying to, to make conclusions from, you know, these kind of uh, very specific interventions about such a big question, it's probably not the right approach to, to use trials. You probably are better suited in looking at large changes that happen over time through observational data, historical data, and you can still have 
a good identification because interventions are sometimes idiosyncratically started in some place and not the other, so you, you, you don't have to worry that maybe you're, you're, you're seeing a confounded effect. Right, so certainly uh, there are situations where, where you know, we, tend, we tend to use trials and draw wrong conclusions from it. But I would also say that there is perhaps a, a, a brighter future ahead in, in, in terms of uh, the use of RCTs. Uh, and sometimes, you know, uh, paraphrasing Nelson Mandela, sometimes maybe playing small is quite important. Like there are, I think there still are questions out there where you may be in a good position to, 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 to do some experimentation and, and, and testing. Things that have to do with, 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 you know, with human behavior. How do people respond to different incentives? Right, um, so, you know, think about rural India, right? And many of you know that, you know, Prime Minister Modi has made this huge promise that he will make India open defecation free, I guess, by, uh, uh, you know, later this, later this year. Uh, and they invested a lot in, in building the infrastructure, in building latrines. But not, not all the latrines that are built are, are being used. And, you know, obviously they're not as useful if they're, if they're not used, if people still go out and, 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 and go in, 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 in the open. So the question of how do you make people utilize the infrastructure is perhaps an area where, um, you know, you could try different incentives. You can try some community-based approaches. You can try some, uh, you know, name and shame. Like we, we don't, maybe we don't know what works. So if, you, if you've established okay, I want to solve a specific problem, but I don't know how, maybe that's an area where, where, where we could use perhaps more, uh, more experimentation. Or to give another example from my field, and I guess, you know, if you have spent some time in the field of sanitation, this discussion of, of you know, uh, human waste is not as uh, a big deal for me. So, but if it is a big deal for you, I apologize, but you shouldn't. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a completely natural thing. So the second example comes from, um, from uh, Dakar, Senegal, where, in fact, most people have latrines. It's not a problem of, of having latrines. But the question of what happens when a latrine fills up, when you know, you've used it so much that it, that it overflows, what do you do then? And there are good options. You, know, you, you call and you hire this guy to come with the, with the vacuum truck to suck out the contents and take them to a treatment station, and there are bad options. When you hire someone, you know, with uh, literally a, a bucket to empty it, kind of like by, by manually, by hand, and take the contents and empty them right outside your house. So how do you incent people to, uh, to switch from, from this bad sanitation option to a good sanitation option? Again, seems like a, a, a question where you could employ some of the uh, experimental approaches. So, I, you know, I'll conclude by saying that, yes, certainly uh, we tend to over-rely on, on, on experiments in, in, in some areas, but there still are some interesting questions out there where, where we could use more experimentation. And I certainly feel, I mean, you know, every feeling is subjective, I feel that even the, 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 the most staunchest proponents of, of uh, randomization do have this idea in mind that, you know, perhaps they are better suited to answer last mile questions rather than, you know, system-wide change, uh, change questions. So I'll, I'll, I'll end on that note, but of course happy to take questions at the, at the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Radu, for this presentation. I think it's very useful to have very concrete examples where it can be used in cases where it's not uh, useful. So now we move to the next uh, speaker, Jonathan. He's going to talk, I guess, at least partly about finance, right? Thank you. It's really uh, a great pleasure to be here at AFD, to share ideas, to be in conversation, trying to figure out um, together some really very difficult um, questions about how we learn about 
uh, you know, very complicated um, problems that really have huge impacts on poverty and inequality around the world, on economic growth. So I want to give you a, a bit of a kind of personal, professional uh, sense as an academic researcher at New York University. But I've been involved in microfinance, the idea of microfinance, for maybe 25 years. And I've seen this field grow. I've seen incredible innovation, entrepreneurship, um, great passion in creating new institutions that work in villages and neighborhoods around the world. Muhammad Yunus in Grameen Bank, Bangladesh, won the Nobel Peace Prize. It was very exciting. And the dreams for microfinance, you probably know well. And Muhammad Yunus you know, has described the idea of poverty museums, you know, imagining the day when microfinance has spread so far and reduced so much poverty that one day poverty is eliminated and we'll take our children, our grandchildren, to go to the museum to see what life was like back in 2019 when poverty was part of the world. And so these <laughs> ideas, these dreams, these ambitions um, have been part of microfinance um, for s a long time. And yet we haven't had very good estimates, very good evaluations, very credible numbers on whether microfinance really works. Right? We have a lot of stories, but not great evidence. And I want to share a little bit about how things have evolved and why things continue to be difficult, describing the role of RCTs. I want to argue that RCTs, perhaps as Jean-Paul Moati started us off with, they've been oversold in some important ways and undersold in some other ways. And I want to sort of continue that, um, that conversation. And so the, the fundamental problem in trying to figure out whether microfinance works or not is that it already exists. Grameen Bank already exists. So you can't really see what happens you know, if there wasn't a Grameen Bank versus now there is a Grameen Bank because it, it already exists. So evaluating, say, Grameen Bank is very difficult. And if you uh, did a survey of its members, you'd, of course, run into a problem if you wanted to compare them to, say, people in the village who didn't join the bank. Right? Because after all, maybe the people who join Grameen Bank, they're, they're more ambitious, they're more energetic, they want to start businesses, they want to change their lives. Maybe there's something about them that just makes them different and that it's not really an impact of Grameen Bank. It's something that we know as selection bias. The, the customers are perhaps selected in a way that makes them special and makes evaluation difficult. What I want to share in the time I have is to describe then what happens when randomized control trials of microfinance arrive, what they look like, and, and really why they've been in many ways frustrating um, for those of us who've been very eagerly waiting and very hopeful to learn from the randomized control trials. And then I want to talk about some other kinds of randomized control trials that I think are very promising and are actually helping us answer some important questions. And one of the important ideas I want to suggest is that people suggest the micro, <laughs> sorry, the randomized control trials um, are very powerful because of the ways that it addresses selection bias in a statistical sense. And what I want to say is that there's another important thing, which is that randomized control trials, these experiments, are often very important ways to kind of disturb existing practices, to create variation. And that allows researchers, policymakers, to start to see possibilities and changes. And that's what I want to um, focus on. So less about what works and more about what could happen. How do things work? Why do they work? And so that's um, where I want to go. Now, Martin mentioned um, a kind of selection bias, which is um, with the randomized control trials, you often end up focusing on particular segments and particular kinds of organizations, particular kinds of interventions, because they're really um, most amenable to using RCTs to evaluate them. And it's absolutely true. The area of microfinance, microcredit, is just perfect for, for using RCTs. And Lant, you were telling me um, 
I don't want to take your numbers, but a huge number of all the RCTs that are being done are being done on microcredit because they're private goods, they're, they're not public goods, they're often delivered by NGOs or businesses, they're very small, clear interventions, so you can evaluate them quite easily. So in, in many ways, microfinance, microcredit, RCTs are a very good case for understanding RCTs. But what I want to show you with just a few examples is even in that best case, it's still very difficult to have and build the evaluation that is exactly the one that you want. So I'll give you some examples rather than talk abstractly. Um, but what we'll see is that researchers, even now, tend to be very opportunistic, sort of seizing opportunities when they can, um, rather than, um, a bit like Martin said, kind of thinking more broadly, which are the organizations, which are the moments that we optimally want to evaluate. So there was great optimism for microfinance. And then, as you probably know, a few years ago, a series of studies were published in one issue of the American Economic Journal. And across the board, those seven randomized control trials showed that instead of reducing poverty, as Muhammad Yunus had told us for so many years, in fact, the evidence suggests that when we look at business profits, household income, household spending, kind of across the board, those gray lines means nothing really was detectable, at least in these RCTs. The red arrows are what you expect. There's actually some decreases in uh, consumption and a few increases. But by and large, this is not the story that leads you to poverty museums. So I want to talk a little bit, though, about the studies. And I'll start on one um, to give you a sense of why these are specific studies and why at least people like me kind of waiting for other studies which I think might give us better answers. So here's one from India. Now, India had, has had a lot of growing microfinance in different parts of the country, most of it in the countryside, in the villages, just like with Grameen Bank and, and other organizations. But the, the study which could be done and tested with RCTs wasn't in the villages because the villages were already being saturated with microfinance. So instead, the researchers took the opportunity to um, evaluate a program that was going into the city, and this is Hyderabad, major city in South India in Andhra Pradesh, um, going to the city for the first time. And what was striking was two things. One, this evaluation was possible because this organization, Spandana, um, hadn't been there before. So they could randomly choose which neighborhoods to go into and which not. Right, and that was their control groups and treatment groups. But the take-up was very low. The, in the city, the customers or the potential customers weren't so excited about this new opportunity. And so the people who uh, actually joined Spandana um, was actually under 20% of the people. And so the, um, from a statistical standpoint, it was very hard to have the power to really evaluate what was going on Making it even worse, the control group also could have some access, and they took advantage of that. Making it even harder, there were other microfinance institutions operating in the same places. And so in the end, the difference between the treatment groups and the control groups in terms of who has access to microfinance um, turned out to be very small. Because the researchers were very careful and thoughtful, they could do a study trying to pull out the differences. But we can see that this is, even though it's a randomized control trial, and even though the language of gold, the gold standard is attached to randomized control trials, we can see that in practice, there are a lot of compromises and difficulties in finding the right, um, the right comparisons. So maybe it's not surprising that in this situation, nothing much was found. A second example, this one from a very different um, set of circumstances, um, and it's a study I like a lot. Um, this is from Bosnia and Herzegovina, and this is work that was um, led by um, Greta Augsburg and her team, and she's going to join us uh, in a few minutes. It's a very nice study, but it does something very different, 
and it gives a sense also of how researchers very cleverly took advantage of a situation, but it's not exactly the situation you would want to make real statements about whether something works or not in general. So here in this situation in Bosnia, the organization had a score, and they used this credit score to decide who gets credit and who doesn't get credit. If you're below the line, you're not eligible. So the researchers did something very clever. Right? They took a group of people who had scores just below the line, and they said, let's randomly pick some of them and bring them back into the program. And so those people could be given access to credit, and then the comparison could involve the people who were randomly brought into the program versus people who were randomly not brought into the program, trying to focus on comparable households. It's very clever, very interesting, but it's an unusual population. So for example, this sample, not surprisingly, it's poorer and more disadvantaged than even you know, the other sample, the other um, customers in Bosnia. The uh, credit scores you know, ask things like, do you have sufficient collateral to be able to borrow? Do you have a good business proposal? Do you uh, have the repayment capacity? All the things that you would worry about if you were going to have a customer. And it turns out that, understandably, these customers look not very good on these metrics. So you can do a study of what happens when you give them access to microcredit. But it's a very special study that's very hard to generalize. And perhaps it's not surprising that the study didn't find very much. And so this is the sense in which randomized control trials can be very powerful. And yet, we have difficulty, even in the best cases, matching these tools to the questions that we really have. We have good studies of particular questions, but they're um, not able to perhaps answer the bigger questions than the policymakers have. So let me quickly um, just give you two examples of how RCTs are doing something very different. The first one is from Mexico. And instead of asking, does it work or not, the question is, do customers care about interest rates? For a long time, microfinance experts said, customers don't care about interest rates. They just, they don't have enough capital. They're willing to pay for loans you know, as much as it takes. It's better to go to the microfinance institution than to go to the money lender. And so the interest rate sensitivity is very low. But that w is a testable proposition that had not been tested. And so researchers in Mexico randomized across branches of a bank, Compartamos, that was interested in understanding how to improve their, their pricing and their business model. They randomized what would happen when you would reduce interest rates. Now, Compartamos charged very high interest rates, about 100% per year. And so it was a good thing that they wanted to reduce their interest rates. And they did it in two ways, um, down to 90% and down to 80%, randomly choosing where. This gave researchers a chance to see whether the customers cared. Would it make a difference what the interest rate was in your branch? And it turned out to make a big difference. And that result helped change conversations in microfinance where the assumptions had been that interest rates really don't matter. The number of clients where interest rates were lowered more expanded relative to the, the other places. The total amounts lo uh, lent expanded. The customers had, the bank had many more customers at the end of this, and it wasn't just because of the trend, it was really, you could see it by comparing these different branches. So it was a powerful example of how you can use an RCT. And it was actually fairly cheap because they just needed administrative data. How you can use an RCT to understand how mechanisms work. The last example, very briefly, um, goes back to Bangladesh. Now, Grameen Bank was the big story of Bangladesh in finance. Today, the big story in Bangladesh is mobile banking. All of a sudden, lots of people are getting mobile banking. And one of the reasons is with mobile banking, you can put money on your phone and send it across long distances. So here's an advertisement for mobile banking from the company called Bcash. It says if you're a factory worker, you're working so hard, you're doing overtime, 
and it's a hassle to send money home, so you can do it now um, instantly on your telephone. So we wanted to know what would happen if we expanded this or gave, expanded it beyond the kind of middle class uh, people who are generally using the service. What if we connected very, very poor households to this kind of service and they'd been excluded? One of the things that we see in Bangladesh is that many, many poor regions are sending their children into the factories to have better jobs and to earn more income. This is Dhaka, you see the red lines, that means there's a big increase in population. Dhaka is becoming a crazy, big, modern mega city with lots of traffic and congestion, but also factories and better jobs. All the green bars are um, decreases in population. The rural population in Bangladesh is actually declining. And so what we wanted to do is connect the factories and the factory workers back to their families. That had been a, something that was hard for the, uh, the factory workers to really connect and send money home. And what I just want to share is what we found when we used an RCT to, to randomize introducing this technology to the factory workers and their families back in the villages. And the key thing that we found um, by just doing a very, very simple training, it cost about $12, took about an hour. The first thing is just by doing that training, we took the use of this technology from 20% to 70%. So using the RCT, we could see that people were being excluded from this technology simply because they, um, they didn't really understand it, didn't have access, it wasn't marketed to them, and that was a powerful result in itself. The next finding was that as it became easier to send money by mobile telephone, remittances increased by 30%. And that led to 30% when we do a regression, 27% in the raw data. Um, that led to a shift in the distribution of the income in poor areas um, and a reduction in extreme poverty. Simply by creating this connection and allowing the money to flow from where it was in the capital city back to the villages. And the final part that the RCT allowed us to see was that there were a lot of benefits, but it was very stressful for the factory workers to now have to send money back home. Their parents could call them up and say, hey, we need a little bit of money. Can you send money home? And we can see health issues. We can see emotional health issues as this technology also disrupted their lives and created some um, tensions. And so what I want to conclude is that, maybe going back to Jean-Paul Moati's uh, statement, undersold and oversold. Well, I do think RCTs have been oversold in some ways. But in these ways, with these kinds of examples, in many ways they've been undersold. There are many ways that we can use RCTs to disrupt current practice, try new things, experiment. It doesn't have to be an RCT, but it's often helpful to do it that way. And it's helping us see possibilities in new ways creating new possibilities, um, and helping organizations maybe see how to improve um, what they can do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for this. Uh, th and thank you very much for bringing us to the field and to give us very concrete examples of the challenges that RCT face, but also the kind of answers they can provide, even if they don't answer necessarily the question that we were expecting in the first place. I think this is a very interesting um, observation. So now we move to the next speaker, Lam Pritchett, if you can take a few minutes to react to Jonathan's talk. Is he still there? Yeah. So um, I, uh, last week I was in Kuwait and I was uh, at a conference meeting with some of my friends who are engaged policy practitioners in Middle Eastern countries, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, um, Lebanon. And one of somebody I've known for 20 years who has run a large think tank in Egypt. He has been uh, minister of finance in Egypt. 
said, I am completely, totally at a loss as to what to do to make my country a better place. I just, I don't know what to say. I don't know who to say it to. I'm just flummoxed by the current configuration of social, political, and economic forces such that I just, you know, I, I'm not going to move out of Egypt. I'm not going to abandon my country, but I just don't know what to do. Um, nothing that has been said or done or learned from RCTs would help him. Nothing would help the person who had worked and tried to restore order in Libya would have helped him <laughs> done better in helping create a coalition that could restore order. Nothing that RCTs have done or will do in the future would have helped my friend in Tunisia who has been trying to, again, shape and reconstitute a sec <laughs> he prefers a secular democratic political order in Tunisia, but even a stable political order, forget secular, nothing would help them with the important questions that they're dealing with. So I, I'm the con in this debate. I think I agree fully with Jonathan that RCTs have been oversold, but they've been wildly, totally, dramatically oversold, not by a little bit, by a, by a lot. So I don't know if you remember, and this, I don't come to France that often, but there was a dance craze in the United States, the Macarena, this Brazilian <laughs> dance, da, 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 right? I don't know. Some of you must remember. Some of you must be non-economists and dance. And, um, the Macarena was fun. I've done the Macarena myself. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, but RCTs are kind of the Macarena. <laughs> like, they're this trivial thing. It's kind of fun. Academics pleasure themselves by doing it. But really, in the broader scheme of things, the Macarena is not even disco. <laughs> like, disco was like something. <laughs> and they think they're ballet. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like wildly oversold. It's this minor, relatively trivial, super technical thing. Um, but let me, but it just, it's just trivial in the grand scheme of things. In the following sense, um, national development is a process whereby the country people live in acquires economy that's more productive. It acquires a government that's more responsive to the needs and wants of its citizens. It acquires organizations and administration that are capable of doing more things. And it acquires patterns of interacting with their fellow citizens that are more equal. That's the development process. If you live in a country that has more development, you're better off. Completely like. And if you live in a country that has had really substantial increases in productivity, poverty goes away. Poverty goes away whether there's programs for poverty or there's not programs for poverty, it goes away. The head count measures of poverty are almost perfectly correlated with the median of the distribution of the country that you live in, like full stop. Um, I mean, meaning they are almost perfectly correlated. The correlation between the poverty rate I would predict from your median and the actual is 0.994. Like you can't get closer to a perfect correlation. And that's a broad-based thing. That's the median. That's nothing to do with is there a targeted program. Every measure basically of social well-being that we have is wildly strongly correlated with whether or not the country you live in has higher national development. So to me, all of the important questions about development are questions of how does one initiate and sustain processes that are mostly country specific, that create more productive economies, more responsive governments, 
higher capability organizations in the state and a broader equal treatment of the citizens uh, along lines of ethnicity and sex and other traditionally historical discrimination. If you accomplish those four things, kind of the in the specific, A, the specifics take care of themselves. That's what this happens in a dynamic. The reason why national development leads to all these good things is that the adoption and utilization, the generation adoption and utilization of the knowledge you need is created by the process of national development, not vice versa. So even if you show me like, oh, by the way, an RCT discovered this, it's like, look, in a well-developed country that would have been discovered sooner or later. Like you're talking about like how long was it gonna take mobile people to figure out this mobile money thing that an RCT may have accelerated by months, maybe it accelerated by a year, but like the odds that there was gonna be this huge pressing benefit to having people use mobile money and them not use it if, if it weren't banned by regulatory obstacles, I, I argue is low. And that's why national development is the whole story. RCTs almost by definition are not amenable to answering the questions about national development because they happen at a system level. The economy of a country is the economy of a country. It's not parsable into, as Martin put it, like treatment and control. It's an interconnected systemic whole and you have to worry about the interconnected systemic whole. So um, I think I, I, <laughs> uh, I, so then largely again, it's the Macarena. Like, it doesn't do that much harm. Yeah, you go out, you dance the Macarena, you feel a little silly later. <laughs> but it doesn't do that much harm, um, but it really doesn't do any good. So I'm not like an anti-RCT person, like sure, like <laughs> da, 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 But it just, don't distract yourself and get obsessed with it one way or the other, because it's just not the key to an overall development process that needs to happen. And I don't think any important question facing AFD about how they would structure their activities to promote countries engaging in long-term sustainable processes of national development that would lead to the large and complex goals like the SDGs is amenable to answers, is entirely amenable to answers that would be generate RCTs. They'll generate some little bits of the knowledge that you need, but it's not, I mean, it's just not that big a deal, as is evidenced by the fact that all kinds of countries in the world, A, became completely developed before there were any RCTs. So it can't possibly be a necessary condition of development, or France wouldn't have been developed in 1950, and it was, right? And B, <laughs> there's all kinds of countries in the world, like South Korea, that have become completely developed in the last X years um, without, uh, without any recourse. So we don't look and say, oh, geez, South Korea, huge success. Ghana lagging on national development. The difference is South Korea adopted RCTs. No, completely not, right? Nothing to do with it. And third, all of the indicators of the goals of national development in terms of human well-being, poverty, infant mortality, child enrollment in school, were on a s sharp, long-term, M massive improvement before the RCT craze happened. So it's not like development was failing and kids weren't getting in school and child health wasn't getting better and poverty wasn't being reduced and then came RCTs. The opposite. All of those indicators <laughs> were on steady, rapid, by all historical standards, the last 60 years of human well-being have been better for humankind on any material metric than the previous 6,000 years combined. And all of that happened before any of this RTC fad took off. So again, the, the, the like claim that RCT might somehow be an important element of development, just it, it boggles the mind that serious people maintain it.
you very much, Lam, for this. If I may, I just add something. Macarena, it does not harm, but our city may do may harm sometimes. No, in terms of eviction of methods, in terms of evicting a certain kinds of interventions. Maybe we'll come back to this in the rounds in the last round table. Would that be helps? Um, well, we don't have much time to, to discuss. I, I think, I think Lamp is just trying to be generous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so as I told you at the beginning, unfortunately, we, we won't have time to take questions now. I know it's a bit frustrating. You probably, many of you want to know more about Macarena, but it's not the, time, the right time to, to do that. So I will, we will move uh, straight away to the next uh, session. Uh, but, but all of you will be invited to respond to questions at the very end. But now I'm going to invite So I'm very, I'm very happy to, to welcome uh, Britta Oxbow, who is an RCT practitioner and who accepted to join the debate, to play the game of the debate, which is not so easy, especially after uh, Lant talk. <laughs> so, so many thanks for, for, for coming and for accepting. To I didn't know it was after Lant. <laughs> <but yeah. laughs> uh, so Britta Oxbow, I lost my notes, but uh, let, uh, let, uh, tell me if I'm wrong. You are associate director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies in, in, in London, and uh, you have been leading a number of RCTs uh, in the field of microfinance. Uh, Jonathan has been mentioning some of them, but also recently in the field of uh, uh, sanitation. And uh, so what we found very interesting was to get your own perspective regarding a, a number of arguments which have been made. You're not obliged to respond to everything, but for us it was very important to, 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 to have a kind of debate. And so thanks. Thanks a lot for being here. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's very nice to be part of this round. Um, just to give a bit more background, so I'm part of a team of development economists at the Institute for Fiscal Studies, which is a research institute that aims to contribute to public debate, doing that through rigorous academic approaches. So we work very closely with the University College London and, and other universities. Um, we're all microeconomists. Um, and who within the development field ultimately care about international and national development, but we focus in our work on individuals, on households and communities. So in that sense, kind of we're in line with what um, Rosenzweig at some point said, we think that thinking big and focusing on improving the lives of the poor are actually complementary um, agendas. And actually, kind of a brief reaction also, I think they also link very much, right? As he was talking about you know, improving productivity of the population, well, you, you need to think about how you get people to invest into health, preventive health investment, and to get their children, or to stimulate their children to get actually a popu uh, productive um, population. But so in terms of our work, what um, this means in practice is that we typically tackle research questions or research questions that meet three criteria. They have to be policy relevant, they have to contribute to knowledge and the academic literature, and they have to be, we have to be able to answer them in a rigorous way. Um, manner. Now the approach we take to do so is very typically the starting point is an RCT. It doesn't mean we only use RCTs. My PhD is on propensity score matching. I just did a study using instrumental variable approach. But if we can, we try to use RCTs, which implies also, and I might be criticized for that, that we might not spend time on answering a question that might be very important, but that cannot be answered with an RCT where that can't be implemented. Now, we don't stop there, though. We augment our cities with economic and structural models. We try to always, since we have the opportunity and collect our own data, to include innovative measures. And we also link our data, typically, when we can, to administrative and secondary data. Now, in this talk, I want to give some examples of my own research, because it's focused on microfinance and sanitation. And I know there's quite a few in the audience that work on that as well, to kind of give some examples that support or put in context or add a but to the criticisms <coughs> that have been made. I can only touch some of the criticisms, not everything, but maybe in the break or later, I'm also happy to talk about how we approach things like internal validity, ethics, etc. Um, 
And with this example, I want to convey the, our views. I'm talking personally about mine, but our group in more general, that um, we do, of course, believe that criticisms raised of RCTs are be to be taken extremely seriously. Um, but at the same time, acknowledge that for many relevant questions and settings, RCTs provide the best. And sometimes, I would even go as far and say the only identification strategy. Um, but identifying average impacts of interventions should ideally, ideally only be the starting point for further um, research. So the first criticism I want to talk to is that RCTs answer only very specific questions. An example where this is true is actually one of the studies that um, Jonathan didn't mention, so I'm glad you picked Bosnia and not the Mongolia one, it's the other one um, we were involved in, which looked at the effectiveness of microfinance in stimulating clients' business outcomes and affecting kind of households' well-being. Um, I don't want to like for all the, the work that we do argue why it is important, but you know, microfinance, we know a lot of money goes into it and it celebrates to alleviate poverty, so it's probably something you want to kind of learn more about. Now, this RCT was definitely narrow and specific, like all of them are, just three points. It looked at very specific loan product design. It concerned that limit number, a limited number of outcomes. And it, we ran the study in a very specific context that's totally untypical for microfinance. Like, I don't remember the exact numbers. If in Bangladesh you have 1,000 people in a square meter, you have like nine in Mongolia, just to put it in context. However, we designed the RCT to actually compare two liability structures, so two product designs, individual versus joint liability, joint liability being what's microfinance like praised for and the one like smart design, design that was invented, but then going the effect is going more to individual liability, so we thought this an important kind of contrast to make. The outcomes that we chose, that we powered our study on, were at that time especially kind of proxying what microfinance was praised for. Um, and then it was published in the end in this um, AJ Applied Special Issue with I thought six, seven, not six other trials, which you know already uh, obviously Mike France is implemented in that a, a lot more context than just seven, but it already kind of improved on getting a general view <laughs> of, of the effectiveness. Um, now the thing is, this special issue is now kind of the go-to reference to argue that microfinance doesn't work. As a side note, like if you read the special issue carefully, that's not exactly what it's saying. It's a bit no more nuanced like that. But in the end, kind of that's the headline message. And you know, we did contribute two papers to that, and we believe kind of the message is, is right given the context, given the studies that were how the studies were designed. But at the same time, we're also writing currently two papers that argue that microcredit uh, credit is one effective, uh, a an effective financing mechanism to improve household sanitation and can, can be complement very well government finances, subsidy scheme in India in particular, it relates to um, the program that Radu was mentioning, to increase sanitation coverage. So this just to say, you know, even if you have a collection of RCTs and you build on that, obviously it doesn't tell you everything about the intervention and there might be more to it than you know the, the special issue might tell you. Now the second criticism I want to talk to is that you know not only are these questions very specific, but they are not always the relevant um, questions. And here I want to just go back to this RCT that we conducted on microcredit for sanitation, um, where we designed the intervention to answer the question whether the, pro the provision of credit for sanitation is effective in increasing sanitation ownership. Now, for many practitioners, and here I mean especially those that run microfinance institutions or support microfinance institutions, they kind of learned also along the way are more interested in answering whether sanitation loans are used by households to make sanitation investments. Now, this is a maybe not obvious distinction, but what the difference actually is is that the first one, the RCT, looks at whether the credit leads to toilets that otherwise would not have been constructed. Whereas the second is more an auditing purpose, kind of thinking of the loan that I give you, do you use it for the purpose that I want you to use it for, whether you would have built a toilet anyway, and maybe that would have been with more expensive money from money moneylender, or you would have used your savings that you can now use for education, but at least you use it for sanitation, and you know whether we get more toilets than we otherwise would have is not what they care about. The important thing is that for the second question, you actually do not need an RCT. So it's the point is, you know, the how you design the evaluation depends on what question um, you want to answer. And finally, and we've heard this before, that you know, RCTs leave many questions unanswered, like why does an intervention work or not work? How does it work? How can it be improved? How can resources be used more effectively? And 
I agree it would basically be impossible or really ineffective and costly to, for every question that comes out of an evaluation, to plan another RCT and implement that and pay money for it. At the same time, and we've heard this before, these are probably the relevant and interesting questions that you want to have the answers to. Now, the way we approach that, and we're not unique in that, there's a lot of academics doing that, is that we don't stop at the average impacts, and we rarely or hopefully never let the data and results speak for themselves. So I'll let you read the quote, I really like it. Um, so what we do is we write down economic models that guide our thinking on how reported impacts might have been achieved, and to be also open to the reader in how we get to the conclusions that we make in our studies. And we also sometimes estimate structural models to simulate outcomes and counterfactuals. Um, to give you two more concrete examples, what that means is going back to this RCT where we looked at the effectiveness of giving credit for sanitation. We wanted to kind of find out, you, you know, we learned that that's effective in improving sanitation coverage or increasing sanitation coverage in rural India in this case. Um, but what is driving that actually? And to answer that question, we developed a theoretical framework and combined that with our empirical results. And we were able through that to conclude that actually simply putting the label on the money, so not just giving the money to the household, but saying here you get the credit and use it for sanitation, or giving the person the choice to take the label for sanitation, influences investment decisions for the household. And that's not an obvious thing, just very briefly, because sanitation loans are social loans, so they're actually cheaper than business loans. They're very little monitored, and it's not enforced how clients use the money. So if you're rational, you would just use the money and invest it in whatever you want to invest it in. But more important, why is it relevant or important from different perspective is that you know, microcredit has been now forward to support human capital investment, and it's done quite a lot. And some people would argue, you know, maybe people don't use the money for what you want them to use it, so let's, instead of giving them just the money, let's give them actually the materials to construct the toilet so you can be sure that it's used in the right way in your perspective, right? There's one other study that actually evaluates microcredit for sanitation, and that looks at the willingness to pay and how microcredit um, improves that um, for sanitation. And they also find that this is a, an, an effective way, but interestingly, they show lower loan to toilet conversion in that context than we find in our study. So we find that about half of the loans were used for sanitation investments, new investments, whereas they, I think, find one third. Now, why is the difference? That's a question at this point we can't answer. You know, one could design an RCT to do that. Um, but you could hypothesize that, you know, giving the person the money make, allows them to have a choice to invest in the toilet that they actually like, whereas the material is not. I don't know, it's a hypothesis at this stage. But just giving the money the way they do it typically, because if you think about it, microfinance is always labeled, you know, whether it's business or something, is kind of cheaper. The institutions don't have to change how they do it. They don't have to source materials, et cetera. Now, the second example goes um, back to the Mongolia study that I mentioned before. And we saw already on the slide from, from Jonathan that you know, we didn't really find much impact. But actually, when we compared the joint versus indiv um, individual liability, we find that there was higher potential in the joint liability loans in increasing um, consumption compared to individual liability. We also experienced that there was differential loan uptake. So the people that selected into the type of loan, the character characteristics changed. So we, so we went on and looked at what might be driving these differences. And here we again used a theoretical model and um, an empirical, the empirical data that we'd had. And we had actually collected some quite neat, I would argue, data that is kind of subjective returns expectations for investments that households plan to make. So basically asking them, now if you invest the loan into what you want to invest it to, what do you think will be the return on the business or whatever you invest it into? And with that, we can kind of construct a measure of riskiness of the investment. And we're able to show with a combination of approaches that actually joint liability offers a way to diversify risk for these clients. So it's basically an insurance role, which is not a new idea, but we were able to show it in this context. And this has policy relevance, because especially in risky environments, risk averse borrowers might actually value the aspect of joint liability. And considering that there's a kind of relatively strong shift towards individual liability, kind of probably good to consider that in many contexts this might not be the right direction to go into. Now the final point I want to talk to, the final criticisms, is that RCTs have no external validity. Again, you know, I mean, broadly speaking, I, I totally agree with that point. And one example, actually a Gates-funded study, is where we collaborated with WaterAid, an international NGO, in the UK and Nigeria to evaluate a sanitation demand creation intervention. 
which was actually the government's strategy to address the sanitation issue in the country. After long discussions, actually, with um, Watay, we decided to do so with an RCT. The key finding that we got away was that, on average, the intervention was not successful. So they found we found an increase in open defecation by three percentage points, which did not sustain over time, which we looked at about two and a half years, a bit more than that. We then conducted our heterogeneity analysis, um, which we've heard about before, which is something that we very often do to kind of start understanding mechanisms of, of impacts. And what we looked at was um, uh, what this heterogeneity al analysis allowed us to conclude is that the intervention was actually effective in poorer communities. There we found a reduction of nine percentage points um, and it was ineffect ineffective completely in rich communities. And these effects were sustained over the two and a half, three years that um, we considered. Now clearly, this is a very specific context. The implementation is done in a specific way. The definition of rich and poor is very context specific. And this is you know, hardly transferable to all the countries, uh, to other countries in many cases. And add to that, um, there have been five other randomized control trials that I'm aware of, maybe even more, that evaluate this approach um, and that find really varying impacts of it, from no impacts in Bangladesh to very large impacts on both uptake and health of children in Mali. Now, we kind of went away and thought, okay, maybe our finding on this poor and rich, maybe this can help consolidate these results a little bit. So what we did is we accessed the data from these studies, kind of we, est we estimate the impacts just to have them like comparable, but basically the, the um, impacts remain the same. And then um, we decided to just very simply order the impacts by the poverty level of the region where this program was implemented. Now, I was already saying, like measuring poverty with the death burn on assets, like it might be very different in context. So we used a comparable cross uh, region comparable index, namely night light intensity. So this is a measure that you can get for basically every area in the world. It just shows you at night how intense is the light in that area, which has been used as a proxy for economic activity and with that for wealth of the region. Um, and we just plot these and basically what we see is an inverse relationship between area level wealth and program effectiveness. So it looks something like this. The green bars show the level of um, night light intensity. So basically to the right you can see the rich countries and to the left where there's basically no night light are the poor countries. And the dots are kind of the reductions in open defecation um, because of the CLTS, this um, demand creation intervention. And what you can see is that in the rich areas, they all hover around zero. So basically there, they didn't have any impact, whereas the impacts that have been observed are all in these poor areas. Now we use this to argue that, you know, our findings have some plausible external validity in that we can make policy recommendations in the Nigerian context, but also beyond that, kind of suggesting that under limited resources, you might want to target CLTS to poorer communities. And this can be argued as important because in 2015, and by now maybe more, 24 countries had actually adopted CLTS as their national strategy. And most of the time, they use it as a blanket approach. They exclude urban areas, but otherwise they just use it in all rural areas. These are all the questions I wanted to speak to at this point. To summarize very briefly, so we take these criticisms seriously, but we do believe that RCTs are a useful tool to achieve exogenous variation, to answer policy relevant questions, particularly when used um, beyond the average impact and as just as a starting point for further research. So our quest is to understand and acknowledge the limitations of our city, but at the same time also understand its merits and not like was done at some point in the field of microfinance to go from one extreme, a hype of our cities, to the other just that we would dismiss it as a useful tool. And maybe rather to try and get more out of them, you know, and encourage research to go beyond average impacts and you know, you, you can use RCTs to learn about human capital production functions, to learn about the importance of context and understand, you know, behavioral constraints and things like that. So thank you for being back. I hope you all had a nice drink and I hope some of you could practice a bit your Macarena style. Uh, so just to, to remind a bit uh, the the... the, the the framework of this conference and also why this, the format of, 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 of uh, 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 the, the, um, the rounds and, and, and interventions is a bit peculiar is that 
So we were here in Paris for a collective book where all these uh, very interesting people came to make some contributions. And so we had a meeting, all of us, uh, one and a half day discussing, debating, and we haven't even started to end up uh, this, the, to finish this, this debate. So basically, what we wanted to have is to have somehow to give other people a glimpse of what is the state of the debate and of the exchanges on, on these questions about how do we measure results of uh, uh, development intervention. So here, we really wanted to have all the, 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 the contributors that could to, to have them speaking, which is why we have somehow a bit packed uh, 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 agenda. But uh, uh, it was, we felt it very uh, important to give you a glimpse of, on this diversity of, of, of questions, issues uh, raised by uh, these methodological questions, and to show that it's, it's important. If, if, if you don't care about RCTs, RCTs will care about you. So just, just, just be aware of that. And, and, and so that was a bit the, the idea. So now I have uh, five very uh, 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 interesting uh, uh, in, uh, contributors who will talk, each one of them, of, of, of their specific uh, contribution and, and a bit the, the angle that they have. So I, I, I will uh, uh, start presenting uh, uh, on the order. So uh, uh, Timothy, Timothy Ogden here, he's the managing director of Financial Access Initiative, which is a research center focused on financial services for low-income households. He's also an adjunct professor at uh, New York University Wagner and managing professor of the US Financial Diaries Project. Uh, he has many other uh, hats, but I, I would like to say that he writes a lot of books and, and a lot of very interesting things. And one of the really appealing uh, piece that he uh, recently edited f uh, was a, a book uh, labeled uh, um, um, Experimental Conversations, where he really interviewed the most prominent randomistas and also critics on this and really uh, uh, managed to make a kind of a synthesis of how this movement was evolving, where is it and where is it going. So, so that was important for us to, to, to have him. Uh, so we also have Anne Polar. Huh? So Anne uh, uh, holds a PhD in economics from Paris 1. Uh, she's also professor in economics at the University Paris Dauphine and an associate professor, uh, researcher at uh, LEDA. Uh, she has also many other hats, like scientific advisor for uh, public policy evaluation at France Stratégie. Um, and she's also one very important hat for us. Uh, she's the chairwoman of our evaluation committee, which means that she oversees uh, uh, the role of the evaluation department, and so my work, our work. And, and so, uh, in that sense, it was very important to have this, this, this perspective on, on these debates on evaluation. Uh, uh, I mean, she she's also, she's, has also been a senior economist at, at the, the IMF, and uh, she was also a, a, a vice director at the Treasury, uh, the, the Ministry of Treasury. Uh, I mean, she, she, and she published a lot of things. <laughs> Sorry, I will, I will try not to take too much time. I hope they will, and I will leave them the, the, the room to, to, to complete. Uh, so Francois Roubault also here's, um, here. Uh, I don't know why I look, I'm looking at this paper because I know him quite well already. Uh, so he's both an economist and a statistician. He's a senior uh, fellow at the IRD, and uh, he's also a member of the Dial, Dial uh, Research Unit. Uh, and he's also, very famous for his job about surveys uh, in developing countries. In particular, he's the, uh, he's, he's the one who designed uh, uh, some types of surveys that now became uh, uh, standards, like mixed surveys to both grasp households, uh, w welfare, and also uh, uh, micro-enterprise and in informal sector, so the one, two, three uh, surveys. And he's also uh, very much engaging, en uh, involved in now the, the, the design of new, a new kind of survey that is being uh, mainstream uh, as we speak about governance, peace, and security, which relate very much to the uh, 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 development, uh, sustainable development goal number 16. Uh, and he, he works a lot on, on, on labor market, informal economy, corruption, governance, 
and institutions, and also impact evaluation. I, we also have uh, 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 Andres Garchitorena. So he's a researcher at, at ERD also. He holds a PhD in public health, and he, he was previously a postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard Medical School. He's very involved in the field in Madagascar with uh, uh, his advisor of a uh, project named Pilot that uh, uh, strengthens health system organizations with a strong research focus uh, working in partnership with, with local actors. Um, and also there is Ariane. So Ariane is a professor of finance at the Université de Bruxelles, ULB. Uh, she's also the director of the, cent the CERMI, the Center for European Research in Microfinance. And she holds a PhD in mathematics and a master in, in uh, philosophy uh, of science. Uh, she writes a lot uh, in different journals, uh, and she uh, recently received the, the Warren Samuel Prize uh, uh, for a, a, a paper. So we, we have somehow a, a, a diverse uh, 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 people here. We tried, uh, we tried to somehow cherry pick some angles of the contribution they are uh, bringing to this uh, uh, debate. And so I will, I will start uh, uh, asking them a question and asking them to answer it quite briefly, uh, uh, so one question for each of them. If they have a really a, 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 an urge to, to add something to another question, they can do it, but please, you only have one credit for those for the sake of, of time, because we really want to leave time for the debate with the audience. So uh, um, I'll start with, with uh, uh, Timothy. So you are very involved uh, uh, in our cities and uh, in the, for the book uh, Experimental Conversations, you, you conducted interviews with the main actors of the randomization movement. So how would you characterize the evolution of this movement and how, from this mainstream uh, perspective, did it react to the, the criticism that were addressed to it? Uh, thank you. Um, I, I will say, uh, that uh, I agree with uh, almost everything that maybe everything that Mar Martin said and that Lance said, and I also disagree with everything that Martin said and Lance said. Um, so I'm doing my best job of uh, um, impersonating an economist um, by agreeing and disagreeing with everything. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's somewhat impossible not to react to some of what what's already been said. Um, and, and I want to frame that in that in Lant Pritchett thought. Um, uh, and it, when you, you start off thinking about what, what Lant said, it, it all makes sense until you start to think that everything that he said also applies to the aid industry, to microeconomics as a discipline. Uh, and if you believe Lant's criticisms of RCTs, the way he phrased them, uh, you should shut down all aid, all NGOs, and all microeconomics fields of study. Um, because only macro stuff matters, um, and you know that is a a, a faith commitment uh, as much as uh, any of the randomistas have to the randomization movement. And so, uh, when we think about how the this movement has evolved, um, and it is evolving, um, I, I think, uh, as I said, you know, uh, Martin's ten things are all true, but there are all, in each of those 10 things, there are already significant examples, uh, Britta was giving some of them, of people in the movement reacting to that. Uh, so uh, for instance, um, things uh, evaluating things over the long term. Um, as we speak, there is a RCT being presented at the Oxford Center for Study in African Economies Conference about a nine-year follow-up to a cash transfer program. Uh, there are a number of other studies now that are going back and following up on these short-term RCTs after 10 and 15 years. Um, it, when we think about sort of going to scale, uh, Muraladhar and Niehaus and Sunkartar ran an RCT of 19 million people in a uh, full-scale national government uh, employment program in India. Um, when we think about um, uh, understanding how and why, uh, as Britta referred to this, there's a whole lot more uh, uh, emphasis going into designing experiments so that uh, they are not naive and start to uncover uh, uh, an understanding of how and why. Um, now that being said, it, it's this is a strange position for me because I am not a randomista. Uh, I don't run randomized control trials. Um, and um, 
I am a deep believer in many of the other methodologies. And it is a strange place to be in this world right now where we have uh, this ongoing sort of uh, battle of extremes that mirrors, um, you, you may, it might sound familiar to you to sort of if you turn on the news, um, these ongoing battles of extremes um, that uh, presume often it seems that um, other people are not operating in good faith. Uh, and in my experience working with all of the critics, they are making critiques in good faith. Uh, and when I talk to the randomistas, they are doing what they're doing in good faith. They really do believe that they have a unique skill to answer specific questions and that those questions matter a lot. Um, and at the same time, I really, you know, the, the, the critics are right that the RCDs don't answer every question. Uh, there are limitations. Um, there have been some uh, very over-the-top things said by randomistas at the time, uh, but you know, people say different things. Uh, Martin has, in his paper, should the randomistas continue to rule, um, has uh, one of the things I appreciate about it is he actually tries to create a definition of what a randomista is, um, and that's one of the problems in this debate is uh, who is a randomista. But even Martin's definition. Uh, my take, if, if you gave that definition to any of the 10 leading randomistas that I interviewed in my book, not a single one of them would say, if that's the definition of a, a randomista, I am not a randomista. And so um, we have these evolving understandings. I think we should expect, I think we should demand that these techniques continue to evolve and get better, uh, and that uh, I do see that progress happening. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, I'd like now to turn to, to Ariane. Uh, Ariane, you, you, you have been following, uh, followed very closely the development of impact assessment in the field of microfinance, and you, you have made a, a valuable contribution to the book regarding uh, the, question, the issue of, ethical, uh, of ethics in RCTs. Uh, we've only touched upon these this, this subjects during our discussions. Could you tell us more? Uh, uh, what do you think are the main ethical challenges raised by experimentation, and how can they be addressed? Thank you. So uh, first, of, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I was very happy to be here. I'm still very happy. And um, yeah, when I discovered how important our RCT uh, are in the field of development and development economics in particular, I was surprised to see that there was very little concern about ethical issues. It's really about I'm not going to give this one, say this one is good, this one is not good, but they, in many of these studies, they don't even mention the concern of ethics. I, I think that's the point where we have to start from, and not trying to be too technical about what we have to do, that there are uh, ethical issues, and they bring technical uh, problems, but that's, a bit too far for the moment. So now one thing that uh, randomistas can answer to this uh, concern is saying, well, we know everything and medical studies have gone through, through all this and now we can just take the lessons from what they have done so we don't have to bother anymore about ethics. So let's see what's going on with medical studies. And indeed, as you may know, there have been a few scandals about how medical studies uh, did, especially in developing countries, but also with poor black population in the, in the US, for instance, and in other circumstances also with native population. So there were scandals, and now, uh, in medical studies, people have become much more prudent with ethical considerations. And for instance, in top journals in medicine, uh, they require to have uh, uh, some ethical uh, criteria met before, even if the result is very interesting from a medical uh, standpoint, if you don't uh, pass uh, m uh, ethical standards, and, and there, there are precise requirements for that, you, you, cannot just, you cannot publish. That's as simple as that. I don't see that in development studies so far. 
So, of course, there are some ethical concerns. Typically, these concerns are dealt with locally. So in each university, you have like either permanent or temporary ethical uh, uh, groups or whatever ethical committee they, they call themselves. But it's on a case-by-case -case basis, and the criteria are not universal. So I hope uh, it, we won't have any scandal and that we will not have to wait until a scandal uh, occurs to deal with this issue. But um, I think it's still an understudied issue. That was my, Thank my you very view much. On, on, on ethical concerns. Thank you, Ayan. You're welcome. Um, I'd like now to, t to turn to Francois. Uh, so you are both an economist and a statistician, and you, you speciali specialize in the production of data, uh, in, in particular in developing countries. So what do you see, what are, according to you, the, the synergies between the current movement in favor of RCTs and the national statistical systems? And how do you assess the enthusiasm for experimental approaches, uh, uh, the current one? Yeah, thank you, uh, Florent. Before uh, answering the question, I want to say that uh, all the contributors of the book are here. Some are not present, but we've got here Cathy from Oxford University Press. So uh, she uh, is participating in this, uh, in this uh, trip to the publication to the book. So if you've got your memories to publish, you can just contact Cathy and she will welcome your proposal. Uh, so on the data issue, there's two levels, the micro level and maybe a more macro and institutional level. So I'm very happy that, uh, I don't know, by chance, uh, both Jonathan and uh, Brita uh, took the example of the, of the special issue on microcredit uh, on uh, the very famous uh, review, six uh, randomized controlled trial with general lessons. We've got the, uh, the general conclusion presented in the figure by Jonathan. Uh, he didn't uh, choose one of uh, the RCTs. We choose for different reasons, because mainly the data were available, to try to assess the quality of the data. Usually it's not possible to have this. When you are publishing in a journal, academic Same journal, uh, you just discard the theory, you just... Uh, look if the reasoning is, is correct, econometric methods, but the quality of the data is a, an under-regarded issue. Thanks to providing the data uh, for this journal, and thanks also to somebody who seems normal, but Florent, who is crazy, in fact, uh, he recorded uh, 6,000 lines of code of this RCT, reproducing the results of uh, this paper, uh, line by line, from one software to the other one, so very clear that uh, what has been done and reproducing it exactly. And, and what is the result of this is, as a statistician, I've been participating in tens of survey, coordinating and in the field, in, on three continents, even in France, and I've never seen such a mess in my life. In my life. Uh, everything is wrong in this, uh, in this uh, RCT. Uh, by the way, I should say that it has been uh, published by the most prominent figure in the field. So uh, this RCT is praised. It could have been chosen. But when we look in the kitchen of the production of the fabrics of the data, we see that, in fact, nothing can be drawn from this RCT. So, is it bad fate, uh, as it has, well, we, we, we uh, happen to have this. Uh, we think that this should be assessed more broadly, but for sure we found and we, we published or we draft a companion paper to try to analyze how uh, this could happen. Such a mess, uh, there are problems in, in other uh, survey, conducting survey, but at this stage, with the most fa uh, famous figure of the RCT movement, I've never seen that uh, in my life. So the problem with this is that conclusion on the table uh, by Jonathan is uh, it makes harms in the sense that 
Nothing can be drawn from the, this paper, but at the end of the day, it contributes to the common knowledge of uh, what are the average impact in different contexts in our city. So, my conclusion, it's just one example. Maybe we are at the lowest tier of the, of the story. So, the first conclusion is, well, uh, let's replicate. Like David Bowie used to say, not Macarena, but let's replicate again. Second point, what, what can be the alternative? Because our cities is costful. Average cost of an air city is half a million dollar to one million dollar. With this amount of money, we can sustain the statistical system on household survey, uh, official one, in Madagascar for a few years. What provides this RCT for this amount is one paper in one journal. Nobody has done anything else apart from other replication, uh, proving that this paper has been underpowered. But uh, one paper and at the same time sustaining uh, the statistical system of uh, official statistical system of one country, I know well, Madagascar. So obviously, as a public good, I would opt and suggest it would be better uh, to invest the money in uh, this possibility with the idea that these official data, it has been, uh, we, Martin spoke about op observational data surveys and try to, to assess impact with this, but with specific uh, ad hoc protocol subsampling a region using uh, the, the infrastructure of the data some impact evaluation can be done. Main, maybe our cities in partly, uh, but at least using it as a public good with more than one paper for one researcher. And for this, maybe as a proposal, there is this uh, proposal of, in France, of an alliance between uh, the three institutions uh, which are uh, working on the data, public data, uh, in uh, developing countries, AFD, which has a mandate uh, for this, INSEE, which is the National Statistical of France with uh, a cooperation department, and IRD with uh, knowledge in that, to try to propose innovative solutions in terms of data uh, alternative to pure RCTs. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we even have proposals. Uh, so maybe, Andres, I, I, I would like to, 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 to give you the word now to, to so the, the, I've, 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 we've seen from, from what Jean-Paul Moati said at the beginning, the field of health is, not, if not the first, maybe ag ag agronomics where was the first, but it's one of the first where experimental approach have been mainstreamed. Uh, what, according to you, have been their effects in terms of knowledge accumulation uh, so in this field, and, and, and uh, did they have had an impact on the policies, on, on the health policies? So what, what was the impact of impact evaluations on health policies? Thank you. Um, yes, I think the health sector is actually a great example uh, of the potential value of our cities, but also of the potential dangers of an over-reliance of RCT evidence. Uh, so, you know, it's undeniable that RCTs have transformed completely the medical field, right? Like, uh, it has allowed for the robust evaluation of medical products like drugs and vaccines. Um, and, you know, it has allowed for the regulatory systems that are around the pharmaceutical uh, industry. Um, in terms of clinical practice, uh, they are one of the cornerstones of the evidence-based medicine, which aims to improve clinical practice by providing uh, to clinicians the best available evidence so that they can acquire the best potential practices on their field. Um, and in that sense, you know, like international organizations like the WHO, oh, sorry, but uh, also, you know, national institutes of health like uh, the NICE Institute in the UK, part of the National uh, Institute for Health, they rely largely on RCTs to provide recommendations on you know, how clinicians should be uh, giving care. Uh, 
That said, for those of us who are in the global health area, and especially those of us that are on the field, one of the most important questions that we feel there is right now in global health is, okay, why if you know, there are scalable, well-proven solutions, uh, cost-effective, right, that are, have been proven by RCTs, why it is that the people that need them the most are not accessing them, they are not benefiting from that. And you know, one of the potential reasons is that in order for a sick child who with diarrhea to get, for example, something as simple as oral rehydration salts at the point of care, there are many, many things that need to align. There are many components uh, in the health system that need to align. So you need trained health workers, you need appropriate infrastructure, you need, um, you know, good and reliable uh, delivery systems, so supply chains, and unless all those elements are in place, then that child will probably die. Um, and so, while th since the SDGs, a lot of RCTs, hundreds of them, have provided great insights for how to implement vertical programs, such as, you know, providing great guidelines for prevention, and diagnosis and treatment of things like tuberculosis, malaria, HIV, uh, certain child health interventions. Uh, so even though they have been greatly influential in how to uh, develop certain health policies, we still don't have an answer to that, right? And uh, partly the explanation is because uh, since we think RCTs are a prerequisite for investing in certain solutions, then, uh, you know, health, sorry, systems approaches, like sector-wide approaches, have been completely neglected, right? And so w right now we're in a situation where we have a multiplicity of vertical programs, but the health system that is supposed to, to sustain that is almost non-existent, right? And so even though there was a huge increase in development aid for uh, vertical programs, for health system strengthening, for example, it has remained constant in the past 15 years. And so right now, the sustainable development goals are trying to somehow improve that because they give a bigger place, at least a name <laughs> to these things in their strategy. And the WHO actually estimates that, you know, we're gonna need about three quarters of the aid on health uh, on these kind of sector-wide approaches. Uh, but how we are going to evaluate that if they are not very amenable to our cities, that's probably one of the big questions of the next few years. Thank you very much. Um, so maybe now for the, for for the our last intervention, uh, I, I would like uh, so Anne, you are, you, are, you chair the, the committee uh, that oversees and guides IFD evaluation activity. What role do you think scientific impact assessments, as a broad our cities and non-our cities, uh, can have in the broader aid evaluation system? And in particular, within impact evaluation, what should be according to you the role of our cities? Okay, that, that's a last question. For, thank you for the invitation. Uh, does the microphone work? Yeah. Um, so wh why do uh, IFD does uh, evaluation of what it, it does? It, it does it because uh, we need to report to uh, people who finance uh, IFD whether uh, wha what kind of uh, or efficient or what we do. But we also want to improve uh, the way IFD is conduct conducting its, its operation. And the last reason why we, we, we there is a lot of evaluation is also that we want AFD to be able to participate into the global debate about, uh, about uh, development. So what do we evaluate? We evaluate a lot of things, too many things, and most of them are not uh, cannot be evaluated by RCTs. So RCTs or any other um, uh, scientific uh, impact evaluation uh, plays only a small part in the business of evaluation of AFD. So we, evalu we, we look at evaluation of individual project for which RCTs can be uh, an instru a tool, but we, we also uh, evaluate the impact of large group of project, like for example, what is the food security in sub-Saharan Africa over the last 10 years? Obviously you cannot do a, a, an RCT for that. But we also evaluate AFD strategies. Are they efficient? Do people know them? Do people follow them? Uh, or we look at how 
uh, AFD uh, deal with, uh, deals with uh, gender issues in all its projects, no matter where they are, uh, they, they have to, no matter they are uh, centered on, on, uh, on gender issue or not. So, RCT uh, play a little, very little role in that evaluation, but somehow, whenever at the Comeva there is an RCT that comes up, or when there is a, a natural experiment that comes up, we are so very excited because we think that it's easier for us, it's less work. Because then we have, the, the, the question is clearer, the methodology is clearer, even though there is a lot of problem, but it looks clearer to us. And most of the time, the answer is, 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 is uh, clear cut, and it's much easier to communicate on any of these, uh, on air cities, than on any other evaluation that we are, that we are doing. Okay. So that's, th that's why we like them, and that's why we, 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 we want to, to see um, uh, more of them. Because we think it's for, for it makes our life easier because we know exactly what to do. If you evaluate the, the strategy of Agence Française de Développement for the last 10 years on, on food security in sub Saharan Africa, this is something that is very large. And we should be more excited by that, by the way, than by uh, the, the, the impact of the, of the metro line in, uh, in, in Rabat. I don't know. Okay, so the, 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 the thing is. It's easier to do RCTs, it's easier to have this kind of thing, and uh, even though it's very expensive, uh, but also, of course, the questions are narrower, and that's, that's the main problem, and a lot of people say, uh, um, uh, talk about that before. Okay, so even though, even though they cannot, RCTs or, um, cannot answer big questions, and they can answer only small questions, I think they can be very useful for the implementation or the way, the the way policies are, are delivered, and someone was talking about the last mile, uh, the, the last mile, uh, the last mile of the of the project. I, th I think they can be very, very uh, useful for that. But I have one fear that if so, first we need to have a lot of RCTs before having kind of uh, an understanding of what works and what doesn't work. And uh, sometimes I'm afraid that we might forget about. Um, the condition under which the results are uh, valid or not. If we just remember the results that uh, mos mosquito nets was better if you if people pay them uh, half a euro, uh, we are going to apply this uh, this policy uh, uh, all over the I mean uh, all the time, and it might very be the case that it's in in other circumstances uh, that that is not the policy to follow. And in that, in, in that situation, what you need is you need, you need a model, you need a theoretical model to know exactly in which circumstances uh, one policy will work compared to another one. Uh, okay, so what kind of theory? We don't have much theory. We have micro th uh, macroeconomic theory, which most of people don't like, but w we need social, uh, uh, social, um, social pol uh, uh, theory we need we need sociology we need we need psychology and we need to 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 uh, to, to have theory that, that on which we can rely uh, to know even with all these rcts avail result available uh, what works when and if we forget that we will be lost uh, in applying the wrong uh, the wrong uh, tool to the to the wrong uh, i mean the wrong tool to a, a given situation Thank you very much. So the, the, the debate is not, is not closed. Now it's time for you to remember to the, all the questions you had uh, during the, the, the past hour and a half. Uh, unfortunately, because you might know there is a strike on the customs and there are delays on the Eurostar, so Brita and Lant had to leave us earlier just to, to be able to get back to, to, their, to their homes. Uh, so, but we, if, if you have pressing questions to them, we can also hear them and, and maybe li leave them for answers for later. But so uh, uh, we now we would like to, to, to engage with you in, in, in a discussion, in, a, in, in question, maybe first question and then discussion. If you, I mean, if you could try and just not to speak too much time about your questions, but before we go into that, I was just seeing that, that, that we, have, we have Anne here and we have also Eva Terberger who is here and who is 
the, the uh, uh, directing the evaluation at the KFW, so our, the German counterpart of, of uh, 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 IFD. And there has been also quite a lot of debate and reflection on that on their side. So maybe before we open the, 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 the floor to, to all the others, I would very much like to have uh, Eva's take on, 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 on this. I can stand up. It's very, is it on? Yes, yes. Yes, yes, it is. Okay, I can stand up. Please stay sitting down. You are one of the... <laughs> I've, I feel embarrassed enough to be that privileged that I'm allowed to speak here for two minutes or thum something, but I'll use it definitely to say a big thank you for inviting me. It was really worthwhile coming, and I got so many inspiring sort of uh, thoughts which I can take home that I can only wish that no, uh, more people from evaluation would have been here, and not only from the academic world. Why do I think that is important? Always when I come here, to IFD, I get a little bit envious because they seem to be so far advanced in these discussions about RCTs. I remember being here about seven years ago and there was David Naudet, a predecessor of uh, Nathalie here, and he was holding a big talk when the uh, when the whole sort of RCT wave was just starting off. And he was saying, uh, we tried it out, and AFD did a lot, but we think it's really only good for what he called tunnel interventions. Tunnel interventions where you have a very narrow idea of what the type of impact is which was supposed to be produced. Nobody else was saying that at that time, but I learned from that. Okay, Germany certainly is lacking behind, or I should say KFW, where I had the evaluation department for financial cooperation. And I think it's partly because you have got this great interaction with the academic world. We haven't got a research department. We definitely never could get all these people together, which I was able to listen to today, and heard so many things which really spoke me out of the heart. Let me only mention two of them. The fungibility I want to pick out, even if it's not really connected to RCTs in the narrow sense. Why? Because I've seen it so often that politicians think everything is all right if you have a project, because you can touch it, a hospital or something. While you have this problem of fungibility if you have budget support, for example, which is absolutely wrong. And you mentioned it. Of course, the sector-wide approach won't help, because uh, then I won't build the hospital, but we'll build, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, the military site or something like that. It won't solve the problem, but one thing which was mentioned. A second thing, which I was really glad about, I've been watching microfinance even much longer than you, you know, should be about uh, 40 years now, and you were the first one where I heard mentioning, okay, all these RCTs went to marginal areas which weren't contaminated by microfinance yet. And they didn't even manage that. Microfinance was there already. And still I hear people at conferences saying, God, microfinance, it never delivered on its promise, you know? of course, taking the headline of your famous article. Coming to my last point, microfinance was oversold. So these RCTs perhaps did microfinance some good because they sort of came back on the ground and it can't deliver on the promise 
of eliminating erasing poverty. But RCTs can't deliver on that promise either. And that's why I'm really glad the debate is here. I carry that back to Germany, because in Germany, in evaluation, the wave is still on. And we haven't got this interaction with academics. So I think it's really important you carry on with your initiative, carry it into the evaluation world, because evaluation is done in lots of institutions where politicians have got the last say, and perhaps that is one problem with evaluation as well, that politicians don't always want to hear what evaluation has to say. At least it should be good things which evaluation delivers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eva. Now, please, yes. Maybe we'll take um, uh, two or three interventions and, 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 and then have a round of, of commentings, and maybe also uh, uh, Jonathan and Radu can, can also add on. Yeah. And Martin, yes, please. You uh, would just pose two questions. Sorry, we need translation if you, if you ask some questions. Yes, so what did you put your headset? Can you come from stage? Très courte. Okay. So Très concise. Alors, moi, je suis originaire du Sénégal. J'ai fait, oui, euh, bon, fait un ouvrage sur la Banque mondiale il y a longtemps. J'avais fait ma thèse dessus. Oui. Alors, je voulais juste être éclairé sur deux éléments euh, qui sont essentiels dans l'évaluation. Où est-ce que vous mettez l'économie informelle Dans les villes, c'est essentiel pour la survie des populations. Et l'agriculture familiale, dans les campagnes, c'est essentiel pour les enjeux de la petite paysannerie. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Je prends une autre, une autre question ou intervention. Thank you. Uh, Mohamed Ali Marouani. I want to go back to Len Pritchett uh, when he said that in the MENA region, for example, we have a problem of we don't know what to do with transitions today. And one of the issues that haven't been talked a lot, but the intervention of Francois Roubaud make me think about is, uh, Randomistas works with NGOs directly. They don't go through government. And this is a real issue in terms of state building. Because if you want to reinforce institutions in the countries, if you work just directly with NGOs and go back and publish your papers, this will not create uh, anything uh, in the country. So this will not help government necessarily do the policies. And one of the ideas maybe that Francois uh, Robot gave was um, to put these, uh, if we want to do RCTs, to put them within surveys done by statistical institutes. I think this can be really a nice route because it's less money, so uh, it can be, uh, it can be uh, less substitution of effort. It's within surveys, official surveys. So in terms of institutional strengthening, it's very important. And the third point I forgot. So maybe they would, uh, the, uh, I would like to have the, your idea about this. If you think that both methods of uh, having surveys, official surveys with statistical institutes and RCTs uh, could be a route that could be followed uh, and could randomistas accept this, for example? Th thank you. Uh, I will take a, a third uh, intervention or question, please. Thank you, Mike. My name is Ian Hopwood. I'm based mainly in Senegal, but I'm here in Paris for a few weeks teaching at Sciences Po. Um, the debate is interesting, and I wanted just to make a plea in front of the high authorities of IFD and IRD and so on to pursue this type of dialogue and discussion in Africa where the challenges are posed. Uh, it's already, the potential is there. Uh, you have a big IRD presence in Dakar. Uh, and I think that one of the things we observe in the Francophone universities is a great uh, weakness in training and dialogue around evaluation related issues, whether they be impact evaluation, evaluation systems, and so on. There is interaction already with statistical institutes, uh, with the interaction. I think there's now maybe a master's program which is emerging through Campus France and so on. Mm -hmm. But there is a huge need to pursue this type of uh, dialogue, to encourage publication. I'm also on the board of the uh, uh, African Evaluation Journal 
to, to encourage publication by practitioners, by actors in the field, so we can build up a body of evidence and a body of, of debate and discussion, just as you're doing here, but to prolong that and to continue it on the ground where the problems are posed and where there is a great deal of difficulty in allocating resources effectively between these different issues, particularly at a time of SDGs, a time of complexity, a time of policy dilemmas in a number of very important areas. So there's a huge need to increase investment from Germany, from France, from the other partners in building and supporting institutions, university institutions, think tanks, and so on in the continent. And why not start in Dakar and move on to the rest? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So, so three question interventions, one about informal economy in urban settings and, 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 and family uh, farming. A second one about uh, the transition, uh, so the, this, this sc scaling at policy level, uh, our cities working or, or evaluations working more with, with national statistical organizations, offices, and, and, and last, uh, a plea regarding uh, training uh, uh, on in Africa and, and bringing the, the dialogue uh, in Africa. So I don't know who, who would like to answer to what. I mean, it, it can be mo even more open. So if, if other IFD colleagues who have more say, because there are interesting things about, about this question in training in Africa, about uh, uh, statistics and this kind of thing. So maybe we could have different interventions. Yes, please. Uh, I, I just uh, to quickly start. Um, it's, it's not true that the RCT folks don't work with governments. In fact, there's a huge amount of working with governments, uh, and in fact, a, a huge amount of effort to train government officials and uh, training young economists who are in going to end up in government jobs. And uh, so I, I, that, that is a situation as the, the randomista movement began, because it was much easier to implement them. I don't think it's uh, significantly true anymore. Um, and specifically to training in Africa, both IPA and uh, JPL have significant training programs in Latin America and in Sub-Saharan Africa to provide training uh, as well as short term, but uh, more than uh, many others are offering, right? Uh, so by no means perfect and, and um, open to a very much critique is that they're only learning one very narrow part of evaluation. Right, they should be learning a lot more, but at least they are, in fact, unlike uh, uh, you know, in, in so many instances, they are in fact in place in these countries, sort of training uh, populations to uh, training people to do evaluations. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, a question to Francois, and then and then a comment. Francois, the the, the trial you criticized about the bad quality of data. Was it an individual randomization? Just. Okay, okay. So, so that's it. It was, ran, but and that's my point because I think it's very important in the debate, especially with epidemiologists. The gold standard in epidemiology is not randomization per se; it's individual randomization, right? You give the treatment A to the first individual, treatment B to the second one, and so on. The problem is that it is very, uh, it is very uh, uh, good, I mean, to some extent, when you compare the single intervention, one drug against the other, right? And that's a gold standard. But when it comes to a multiple component program, then this supposed gold standard becomes the, the, the uh, maximization of problems, because you have com contamination between groups and so on and so on. So, uh, I think it's very important in, in the debate, especially in social science, to discuss are we talking about individual randomization or group randomization? And most of the problem, but because when you start talking about group randomization, you, you, have, uh, you are departing from the usual uh, way to do things and you're just looking for a way to get control groups. And to get control groups is very often helpful in uh, uh, when you want to do it, when you want to answer a question that uh, Anne uh, uh, wants uh, AFD uh, be helped about that. And uh, if the, uh, and it, then it becomes a pragmatic question. The best way to get the control group in that context is it to randomize. Sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. The problem is that 
the gold standard is individual randomization, and individual r randomization is really uh, a mistake, uh, is good for very single intervention, as Andrew say, but it's really the, 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 the worst design when it comes to social, uh, uh, to social programs, to multiple component programs, because you have contamination everywhere, bias everywhere. And so I'm not surprised that you had a problem with the quality uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of this. So maybe, yeah. see, uh, so on the da data issue, uh, informality, uh, there's no objection uh, conducting a city on informal economy, provided that uh, the guy, randomistas, uh, knows what is the best practice to measure in statistics, uh, to how to measure this informal sector. And here is a major problem because Mainly, randomistas are economists. They are not. They have a training in statistics, but not less in practice, and uh, they disregard this. Uh, and there's a good reason why they disregard this upstream uh, statistic to provide good results. Is when you evaluate a paper in a, in a journal, whether you have good data or bad data, without the raw data. Nobody, there's no incentive to have good data because you will not be evaluated on this. So the data is a key issue in this. And the idea to answer what uh, uh, Professor Mawani said uh, is uh, one better than making a survey from the scratch uh, just for this uh, randomized control trial with a very costful small problem but uh, costful uh, uh, surveys, uh, one idea would be to try to have an alliance with the national statistical system and offices in particular on two grounds. The first one is the best practice in uh, low-income country, particularly Africa, are concentrated in these institutions. And the second one is the one you mentioned, is capacity building, uh, public good training uh, of institution uh, which can uh, put that at the, uh, not just for one paper, but for the use of everybody and reconduce it. Thank you. Thomas? En fait, je voulais réagir sur la précédente intervention de François, mais je vais le faire sur les, les deux, en réalité. Euh, François, tout à l'heure, expliquait qu'une un, RCT, en gros, ça peut coûter de l'ordre de 500 000 euros. Et en fait, le, la vraie, il y a des questions méthodologiques sur faut-il faire un RCT ou une autre, mais, ou une autre approche. Mais la deuxième, c'est faut-il investir ce type de montant par opposition à d'autres stratégies de collecte de données, notamment publiques. Et je veux dire que la manière dont l'AFD a évolué dans sa politique d'évaluation et de recours aux évaluations scientifiques, c'est aussi d'insister davantage sur le caractère public de ces données pour que l'investissement qui est fait dans ce type d'études puisse bénéficier, y compris à des ah bon, aux instituts nationaux de statistiques, mais aussi aux équipes de recherche du pays en question. Et il pourrait y avoir un côté choquant d'un point de vue de développement que des investissements aussi importants pour de la production de données, bon, d'abord produisent des mauvaises données, première chose, mais, mais même si elles étaient bonnes, conduisent à des données qui soient privatisées et donc n'aboutissent qu'à une ou maximum deux publications par rapport au potentiel que peuvent avoir ces données dans le débat public de, de pays en développement. Je veux dire, pour nous, du point de vue de l'AFD, il y a deux interrogations, c'est euh, cette méthodologie par rapport à d'autres, mais c'est aussi comment on peut optimiser l'investissement que nous réalisons dans la production de données pour qu'elle serve de renforcement, un renforcement de capacité des instituts nationaux et qu'elle puisse aussi avoir un effet d'entraînement sur les équipes de recherche locales parce que dire, on mesure des effets de développement à travers une étude, mais une étude c'est aussi un investissement de développement d'une certaine manière et on veut s'assurer que cet investissement soit maximal. Je crois que d'ailleurs on partage avec l'IRD le souhait que euh, l'argent qui est investi dans les, la politique de développement et dans sa dimension recherche et l'impact le plus important, et qu'on n'oublie pas l'association des chercheurs et des équipes du Sud dans cette, dans cette dynamique. Merci. Jonathan, do, do you want to add up something to, to the discussion? Martin, did you have some more comments about uh, this first one? So we could take uh, maybe in one or two questions maximum. I have one there, please. Yes, and one here, please. Do you have a microphone? Uh, sorry, okay. Uh, yeah, please. Hello. Very quickly, if you can. Okay. Euh, je vais aller en français, par contre. Euh, je m'appelle Yaovia Gbonkou, je suis doctorant en philosophie politique et éthique. Et ma question sera du coup à madame, euh, excusez-moi, le nom c'est Zafar. Voilà. Euh, alors, euh, ma question c'est comment vous formulez la question éthique sur les RCT euh, Je donne l'exemple d'Alain Renaud, le philosophe français. Quand il se posait la question sur euh, le, la justice globale, il a posé la question, quelles seraient les motivations 
des pays riches à vouloir venir en aide aux pauvres du monde. Donc vous, comment vous posez cette question sur les RCT Merci. Ok. Euh, une autre intervention derrière vous, s'il vous plaît, oui. Uh, hi, I'm, I want to thank uh, Anne Epolar for the mention to, of sociology and psychology in this macroeconomics and statistics debate. And also because I found some connections with the, um, with the um, sustainability science that Jean Paul uh, mentions before. So my question is, um, how can we in practice incorporate this psycho and soci uh, sociological approach to the RCT methodology? And if it's possible, how? Thank you. We have a last, qu the very last question here, please. A and, and then we will stop. Thank you. Thank you. Philippe Sainte-Croix, Ministère des Outre-mer. Le débat a mis en évidence les avantages, les inconvénients de la RCT. Euh, Aujourd'hui ou actuellement, quelle est la tendance d'évolution de la RCT Merci beaucoup. So three questions, maybe. Uh, so I don't know if, if you heard the last one for the for the English speakers, but uh, uh, so uh, uh, maybe I, I, I let Ariane answer the first one. I don't know if was it clear for you or. Okay, you have translation in English there? Okay, uh, from, from English, I mean. Okay, so, uh, well, my point is a bit less ambitious that, uh, than your question, I'm afraid. I'm not, um, I, I'm not discussing about the ethics of development aid in general, just about uh, how randomization is uh, used in development studies when compared to what medical studies do. And one point that I uh, emphasize is about treating equally the treated group and the control group. And it's much um, easier to do so in medical studies. I fully agree with that, but it's not a reason for not even considering that in um, development studies and in economic studies. So um, I, I was just surprised to see not even a mention about that, and especially what is called the equipoise principle, which is a very important uh, issue in, in, uh, in medical studies. It's not uh, always easy to, to do that, to, to fulfill the, the, the uh, equipoise principle, uh, meaning equal ignorance about the benefits of the two uh, arms of the trials. But um, i in the end, they at least discuss the issue. And that's what I would like to see uh, with uh, development studies, at least uh, take into account the, the comparative benefits of the two arms of the trials. But I'm fully aware that it doesn't answer perfectly to your question. Thank uh, you for trying, I Ian. <laughs> Maybe uh, uh, let Anne uh, uh, answer briefly this question about psychology and sociology. Uh. Okay, so there are two things. I don't know how psychology or sociology can uh, be included in an RCT. This is not what I was uh, asking. I was saying that we need, once we know more or less what works in which circumstances, what we need is to understand why. And the RCT doesn't tell, mu tell much about that. So for that, we need some hypothesis, some theory about the way people or network of people function. And economies, economics is trying to do that right now. There are a lot of people into uh, looking at uh, social networks and the way uh, things spread. Uh, but I think that, so we need models. When, some, when something works, we need a model. It, it could be a, an economic model, but it could be a different model that comes from uh, psychology or sociology. Thank uh, you. Okay. I think that Jonathan could uh, also add something on, on this question. Yeah. No, yeah, I think, I think there are real possibilities, um, and in fact, sort of imperatives to be um, serious about sociological and psychological outcomes. I mean, in the work that we did in Bangladesh, some of the most important outcomes were the um, diminishment of emotional health and physical health for migrants 
And if we hadn't expanded beyond economic um, outcomes, we wouldn't have seen these key um, um, events in people's lives. And we would have had a very different view of things. And I think when, we, when we're looking at other financial interventions, we're also seeing how, for example, pushing the formal sector into new communities can sometimes displace um, the informal sector, but also n social networks. So combining uh, serious work on social networks with RCTs is actually proving a powerful um, research strategy. Uh, Florent, can I say one word? Uh, for the question on mixing methods and disciplines, that's exactly what uh, we want to do with uh, Florent, politist and uh, social economist Isabel, an anthropologist, and uh, convinced that uh, only with mixed method and in the broad uh, landscape of qualitative and quantitative method and within quantitative RCTs, uh, that's what uh, we want to do. At the same time, uh, the bad experience, and always w uh, speaking <laughs> of the DRCT we analyze in detail in microfinance in Morocco, at the same time there were the RCT, Isabel and her colleagues uh, were working on a qualitative work commissioned by the IFD uh, to try to see, to, to compare the results and see uh, if there were some connection and so on, but at the end of the day, from the randomista, they were not interested at all in mixing things, never quoting their work, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, there was not this will to collaborate. It was 10 years ago, maybe now they are changing. And on the second question, where were we, are we in RCTs? Uh, I think that we discussed a lot on the sort of a curve that there was a sort of a, uh, a boom in RCTs and then the boom may be going down and then it will come to a plateau like this, a curve like this. And thi that's the idea of the, the cy cycle for a fashion or a mode. I think that we are not very clear about where we are now and it depends on the audience. If we look at the uh, economist, uh, the researcher, maybe after the boom of our city, we are on the descending part of the, of the curve, but not, not too much. If we look at the donors, and in some country, for example, there was the example of Germany, they are still coming up. If we look at the students, at the students, they are still very high uh, on the curve. So it depends a bit on, the, on the, the audience. There is a clear uh, critical work are uh, getting voice, but uh, up to now, Randomistas, which doesn't mean all people making RCTs, but those claiming that there's no other way than RCT uh, to have a rigorous impact, they are still uh, capturing rents and a lot of money and, and some eviction with other methods. are taught how to do difference in difference, and what happens then if they've got the money to finance the pro ipso, it's mm -hmm. all that. So, I, 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 oh yeah, I'm, I'm not sure we'll answer this question. I, I, for the sake of time, I, will, I think I will have to wrap up. I think, I think we see where, where, where you're going, that there's a strong push. Some parts of the debate on the education are very much simplified and oversimplifying this issue while more advanced people have, have more nuanced views and, more, uh, and a more uh, reasoned use of our cities uh, 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 along with other methods. And the whole problem is, is, is to try to find a common language and understanding on these issues. So, th so that, that was also an objective of the book and an objective of this conference to start this debate. We will not end it today. Uh, but before we finish, I would like to give the floor to the deputy CEO of, of IFD, uh, who will tell us a bit about what uh, it is, is the, 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 the vision that we, as a concluding remarks, what is the vision that IFD has for the next years? Not, so not, not a prediction for everything, but at least for our small uh, uh, world of IFD, which is not so small either. Yes, it will not be a prediction. <laughs> uh, mesdames, messieurs, chers partenaires, 
Je veux commencer ces quelques mots de conclusion en vous remerciant. En vous remerciant de la présence de chercheurs internationaux de haut niveau de New York University, Harvard, Georgetown, de l'Université libre de Bruxelles, de Paris-Dauphine. En vous remerciant de l'implication de nos partenaires, notamment la Fondation Bill et Melinda Gates, et bien sûr l'IRD, avec qui nous co-organisons cette conférence et qui nous permettra de faire paraître un ouvrage sur le sujet en co-édition. Et pour vous remercier, vous remercier enfin de la qualité des échanges dont je viens à l'instant d'avoir un aperçu, qui ont eu lieu sur les différentes méthodologies des évaluations scientifiques d'impact. L'évaluation est à nos métiers le temps de la réflexion, de la lucidité, de l'ajustement des convictions lorsqu'elles se frottent à la réalité. Elle occupe la place essentielle de l'expérience et de la raison. Je souhaite mettre en relief rapidement, je vous rassure, quatre points dans ce propos. Premier point, évaluer notre action, c'est être dans une démarche de redevabilité et d'amélioration continue. À ce titre, l'évaluation occupe une place centrale et grandissante dans notre institution. Le président de la République a fixé l'objectif de consacrer que la France consacre 0,55% de son revenu national brut d'ici 2022 à l'aide publique au développement. Les moyens attribués à l'AFD sont renforcés considérablement et cette confiance nous oblige. Nous avons plus que jamais le devoir de rendre compte au gouvernement, aux parlementaires, aux citoyens de l'efficacité de nos actions. Mais rendre compte, c'est aussi le faire de la manière la plus juste, la plus sincère, la plus scientifiquement probante, la moins attaquable sur des terrains où la contestation rôde vite, ce qui est d'ailleurs normal et souhaitable. Cette exigence de redevabilité concerne bien sûr toute la maison. L'évaluation y joue un rôle clé. Elle est partie intégrante de toutes les étapes d'un projet, de sa conception à son achèvement. L'évaluation offre de tirer les leçons de l'expérience, de discerner les erreurs d'appréciation commises, de tirer parti aussi des intuitions justes pour être plus efficient aujourd'hui et demain. L'AFD en ce domaine a l'ambition de réaliser un saut quantitatif majeur pour que la moitié de ces projets soient évalués en 2020. Et au-delà de leur nombre, les évaluations doivent également, sur un plan qualitatif, être plus inclusives en associant de manière plus rapprochée nos contreparties et les bénéficiaires finaux, être mieux comprises anticipées et prises en compte par les équipes opérationnelles pour irriguer davantage les nouveaux projets, couvrir aussi les thématiques prioritaires de notre plan d'orientation stratégique, le climat et le lien social notamment, pour alimenter les stratégies et leurs inflexions et juger de la manière dont nous les satisfaisons. Second point, l'évaluation est un champ de co-construction, de partage d'expériences et de travail partenarial, indispensable à la réalisation des ODD. Le réflexe partenarial est un des piliers de notre stratégie. Il doit s'inscrire dans notre ADN si ce n'est déjà fait. Je voudrais saluer ici particulièrement les échanges que nous avons eus avec la KFW sur ce point et l'état d'esprit constructif qui préside entre nos deux services d'évaluation. Eva Terberger pour la KFW est ici présente, je crois, et je l'en remercie. Nous avons expérimenté grâce à vous de nouvelles modalités d'évaluation qui permettent de diffuser plus largement la culture de l'évaluation dans nos institutions nous travaillons ensemble sur les évaluations climat, sur le recours aux données géolocalisées et satellitaires qui apportent une valeur ajoutée réelle pour mesurer les résultats de nos projets et servir objectivement nos travaux. Il me revient aussi de saluer M. Jean-Paul Moati qui préside au destiné de l'IRD avec lequel l'AFD entretient depuis fort longtemps un partenariat fructueux et particulièrement éclairant sur les enjeux de nos métiers et la manière de les satisfaire. Troisième point, concret, pratique, nous devons faire davantage d'évaluations scientifiques d'impact. Nous avons les moyens objectivement, scientifiquement, de savoir ce qui marche et ce qui ne marche pas. L'action publique doit être basée sur la science et sur les preuves. C'est ce qui a précisé, précédé pardon, à l'expansion des évaluations randomisées lorsque l'on s'interrogeait sur l'efficacité de l'aide au début des années 2000. Aujourd'hui, les méthodologies ne sont, se sont diversifiées. Le besoin d'agir efficacement est plus fort que jamais. Nous allons donc mobiliser davantage la science au service de l'évaluation avec l'IRD, avec le monde de la recherche en général et bien sûr avec la recherche des pays du Sud. Nous menons en effet des études scientifiques d'impact depuis, depuis les années 2000. C'est une particularité de notre institution puisque les bailleurs bilatéraux sont majoritairement en retrait par rapport à ces méthodologies, excepté le BIFID, mais nous sommes bien évidemment très loin des grands bailleurs internationaux qui en ont produit des centaines. Vous avez débattu avec euh, ardeur, j'ai vu ces dernières heures, des différentes méthodes existantes en la matière sur lesquelles, vous avez, sur lesquelles vous avez tous des points de vue assez affirmés. 
C'est ce qui fait la richesse de vos débats et de l'ouvrage qui va suivre. Sachez que vos apports respectifs seront entendus par l'AFD. Cette diversité sera essentielle pour ajuster notre stratégie d'évaluation. Pour nous, il s'agit d'utiliser, en fonction des sujets étudiés, les méthodologies les plus pertinentes pour répondre aux questions sans aucun a priori théorique, en fonction des circonstances dans lesquelles telle méthode doit prévaloir sur telle autre. Nous sommes d'incurables pragmatiques, nos métiers d'action nous y contraignent, mais nous ne nions pas avoir des marges de progression. J'invite nos équipes à, à chercher sans cesse à combler l'écart entre les études d'impact et les évaluations opérationnelles en développant une gamme diversi diversifiée d'outils de mesure permettant de mieux prendre en compte l'efficacité de l'aide. Enfin, la culture de l'évaluation favorise celle de l'innovation. Les évaluations scientifiques d'impact ont eu des retombées significatives puisqu'elles ont logiquement influencé la définition des projets qui les suivaient. Par exemple, en Mauritanie, L'évaluation de l'impact d'un mécanisme de protection sociale qui couvre 40% des femmes a montré que celui-ci augmentait significativement le recours aux soins mais réduisait, et réduisait partiellement les inégalités, mais qui ne touchait pas les plus démunis des femmes et qui n'avait pas d'impact significatif sur la santé maternelle et infantile en raison de la dégradation de la qualité des soins dans les établissements. En conséquence, nous avons complètement repensé la phase suivante du projet en agissant sur les différentes composantes de la qualité de l'offre de soins et en opérationnalisant un mécanisme de gratuité pour les plus pauvres. Les évaluations scientifiques d'impact ont ainsi favorisé des innovations technologiques qui améliorent le suivi des projets. Ainsi, nous proposons désormais, désormais d'aider les chefs de projet et les partenaires à recenser et exploiter les données existantes dès l'instruction des projets afin de mieux estimer les conditions de vie, l'accès aux services de mieux analyser les dépenses des ménages ou encore des images satellitaires qui permettent de suivre la productivité, la déforestation ou encore l'aménagement urbain. Le suivi des projets en cours bénéficie également des méthodes de suivi numérique comme Geopopy développée par l'INRA, que nous avons utilisé pour le suivi de l'agriculture en Côte d'Ivoire et que nous avons même développé comme un outil de renforcement de capacité pour une intercommunalité au Bénin. Tous ces exemples apportent la preuve que lorsque nous savons rendre compte des impacts de nos projets, que nous apprenons à partager notre expérience, à mieux écouter nos bénéficiaires. Grâce à l'évaluation de nos impacts, nous pouvons modifier et enrichir nos actes et nos trajectoires, travailler le retour sur investissement des politiques de développement. L'investissement doit être durable et solidaire, mais il doit aussi être le plus pertinent parmi les options possibles d'emploi des fonds publics dans ses attendus et ses modalités. La roue tourne et seule la bonne analyse des révolutions précédentes permet qu'elle avance en même temps qu'elle tourne. Il me reste à vous remercier tous de votre présence aujourd'hui. Et je crois je, que je vais laisser à Mme Epollard, que j'ai vu tout à l'heure, je ne sais pas. Non, j'ai vraiment le mot de la fin. Ah bon, parce qu'on me disait de passer les micros à Mme Epollard. Donc je la remercie tout particulièrement, puisqu'elle est présidente de notre comité d'évaluation. Merci Mme Epollard. Et donc je vous souhaite une bonne journée en vous remerciant encore de votre présence.